Ladies and gentlemen, we all know that the core task of a scientist is to either retrieve or to create essential new information and to communicate this knowledge to others so that society can benefit from this knowledge sooner or later. The area of medicine, especially biomedicine, is one of the few areas where most people directly feel this benefit by having longer life and perhaps more importantly days and years of life of better quality. But this is not the only function of scientists. They do play a multitude of roles in their professional life. Of course, first teaching the new generation. This is a part of imperative of communication of their knowledge uh, in some generalized form to others, kind of intrinsic part of their duties. And this is true from Wilhelm von Humboldt time, who formulated the principles of contemporary universities, and one of these is that scientists also teach. There are more roles of scientists. One important role is to provide advice to those who have the mandate to take decisions, be it local communities, entire country or continent level, or nowadays also on the level of the entire world, like helping United Nations in their planning or developing sustainable development goals, which was made basically by academies of sciences, they are all targeted to making our life better. And this is all based on, mostly on individual efforts of scientists or relatively small teams or institutions. But what has been much less explored and often not recognized, at, uh, I would say even not recognized at all, even within scientific landscape, uh, is the feature, not the bug, it's a feature. Uh, it's, um, science and scientists are much more than simply knowledge creators or brokers or, or advisors. Just note uh, a very interesting feature of uh, scientific community. We call it uh, worldwide academic ecosystem. It's actually the second largest highly connected group or even family of people after religious congregations. Family who share the same principles. Uh, it's simple that in scientific community facts and logic have clear priority over friendship or political interests, as we know from Plato's time. And more perhaps even more importantly, this is a family which shares the same values of research, integrity and ethics. And these, I mean, what is integrity and what is ethics, are items that um, often divide our world into political blocks today. This feature, if we interpret uh, it in slightly different terms, means that uh, researchers form a huge community that is strongly connected in the contemporary world. And this connectivity via publications is much stronger and faster than any other community of even comparable size. So, sharing the same basic values that are continuously recreated and, and enhanced by making science either together or in parallel. For many, this is a massive channel of soft power changing the world and making even small contributions much more powerful and empowering their messages. And this environment is not really recognized and, of course, totally underexploited today, in particular from the viewpoint of small countries. And the potential of this soft power is truly enormous. Just in parallel, remember what Leonard Merry, 
say it in the frame of an official, official state visit to Denmark uh, 30 years back in 1994, he told, a state with open access to the sea cannot be described as a small state. The same is with science. A state with excellent level of science cannot be framed as a small state anymore. The level of science in a single country in many occasions becomes evident through sim single scientists working in their own country and also, and also coming from this country. There are names which are carved not into stone but into history, such as Uki reaction, after Karl Ivar Uki, or Epic Hort Cloud. You have to be an Estonian to spell it correctly named after Ernst Öppik and Jan Nord from the Netherlands. A small country typically has very limited financial power, almost no economic power or non-existing military power to change the world. But those small in mass can always be great in spirit. Remember Sumerians, a small nation size of Estonia today, okay, relatively size, much larger, many millennia ago, but having a major imprint to the history of the entire world. In this context, um, science already has made our country great in several aspects. Even if I don't like any indicators, but still, in terms of normalized impact of publications from Estonian scientists. We started our journey 30 years ago, um, politely saying in the second hundred, at the end of second hundred of the world countries. Now we have reached position incredibly high, number four, according to normalized impact of, of Estonian, um, the publications of Estonian scientists after Singapore, Iceland, and Panama. And Panama is not a joke. It's Smithsonian Institute of uh, Tropical Research, which is absolute top in the world. So, in a similar manner, many scientists um, who have roots, or who had roots in Estonia, have been working on cutting edge of science for decades in other countries. And I would say that they are the true ambassadors of Estonia who should always call your excellence. Not as diplomats who have this attribution by law, by tradition, but they are driving excellent science and making Estonia much larger than its land area or financial magnitude or military power. And while these financial, military and economic aspects most probably will be forgotten very soon. Contributions into the worldwide pool of knowledge will definitely be rem remembered, literally, until the end of our world. Welcome to this seminar dedicated to a 100-year birthday of Victor Mut. I wish excellent discussions and um, I'm looking forward for excellent presentations today. Thank you. Uh, dear distinguished uh, guests, uh, colleagues and friends, so first of all, um, I would like to thank uh, Ulo Langel and Jaak Erb for organizing this, this event. Uh, dedicated to um, uh, one of the uh, most prominent uh, Estonian researchers abroad. So um, uh, my topic will be uh, not to talk about, uh, about research. I will talk about uh, briefly about Victor Mutt, a uh, little bit about history, although I'm not good at history because I am a national scientist. I am humble biochemist or was used to be hum humble biochemist. But uh, I do have my own uh, personal experience with uh, Victor Mutt, uh, both directly and, and indirectly. And in fact, I uh, did my PhD studies. Uh, my PhD studies uh, were uh, basically focused entirely on one particular peptide, which is called galanin. 
So, and that was uh, what, uh, which was, um, the peptide was um, uh, isolated um, uh, by Victor Moit. So, um, but um, uh, before going to, um, uh, uh, well, my title is Prominent Estonian Scientists Abroad, Victor Moit, before going to um, the topic. So, if we ask, ask the question, how many prominent uh, researchers are there around, uh, well, in Estonia, or particularly abroad, then, um, well, the simple answer is probably not too many, because um, well, Estonia uh, is, not, is not a big country, because Estonia is uh, uh, not a small country, Estonia is a very small country. So, um, and uh, if we look at, um, look at numbers today, how many um, Estonian scientists are there, both in Estonia and also in, uh, well, uh, uh, around, then um, uh, the number is uh, roughly 5,000. And uh, uh, some 20, uh, 30, 200 of those work in public sector, universities, research, public research instit institutions, and um, uh, 1,800 in private sector. So, and I also have um, here, I listed up number of PhD uh, uh, um, students because, well, I am working at the university and uh, uh, sustainability of Estonian research in terms of um, PhD students is uh, today is a huge challenge because uh, PhD studies are unfortunately for some, well, several reasons not uh, too popular in Estonia and we are facing actually um, uh, decline in a uh, uh, number of uh, PhD defenses, and uh, this also is not good for our country. So we have uh, some, uh, a little more than 2,000 PhD stu students today, and roughly 250 uh, defenses a year. Uh, the goal, or um, uh, well, uh, the yeah, goal set by the government is uh, uh, 300 by year, but this is uh, uh, still a goal. But now, um, uh, the president of um, uh, our Academy of Sciences, Darma Sommer, al already mentioned some um, prominent Estonian scientists abroad. So I have also listed those up. Uh, Darmo uh, mentioned Ernst Döpik, um, who is an astronomer and uh, astrophysicist. Was he was at uh, Northern Ireland, if, if, I, uh, if, if I recall correct. Then uh, Darmo also mentioned already Ugi reaction. So Ivar uh, Ugi was a well-known organic uh, chemist in Germany. And um, uh, this Ugi reaction, or organic chemists probably know Ugi reaction, which is a um, multi-component uh, uh, reaction, um, uh, which is named after, uh, after him. Then uh, well-known physicist uh, Indrek Martinsson, who was um, uh, in Lund, uh, in Sweden, Endel Tulving, experimental psychologist uh, uh, in Canada, Rein Tagebera, who is um, uh, today in, uh, in, in, in Tartu, uh, political scientist, and there are more. But um, uh, once again, uh, when, when I um, uh, asked the question, how many are there around? Well, there are more, but uh, not too many because we are Estonia is, is so small. But now uh, coming to uh, Victor Mutt, uh, he's um, well. Victor Mutt by himself is probably not so well known in Estonia, but um, uh, his uh, his uh, nephew is very very well known in Estonia. Uh, uh, who is a uh, very um, uh, well-known writer, uh, Michael Mutt, and uh, uh, I heard from Ulo that he will also join us uh, um, later today. So Victor uh, was born in uh, uh, 1923, that was time when Estonia had, uh, five years after when Estonia had um, uh, become an independent country, uh, that was 1918. And uh, actually, first uh, uh, years of um, his uh, old childhood, Victor spent in, uh, in America, in the United States, because his father, also Victor, but not Victor, who is K, Victor, who is C, was um, a student uh, diplomat uh, in, uh, in New York, and uh, he was also general uh, consul of, uh, uh, of the Republic of Estonia. So um, uh, when they moved back to Estonia uh, in, uh, in late uh, 30, then um, Victor uh, started in school in Estonia and actually he finished high school in, in Tartu, 1943. That was time when the uh, Second World War was already um, uh, going on. And actually Victor's father, Victor C, had already been, uh, well, was um, uh, detained, arrested by uh, uh, NKVD, a uh, predecessor of um, uh, KGB, and he was um, uh, well basically executed or killed in, uh, in uh, Russia. So in, uh, if, I, if I'm correct, uh, that was in early 40s. 
So when Victor uh, graduated, uh, uh, finished his high school, then he uh, fled to Finland uh, under uh, <coughs> dramatic circumstances and then uh, continued to Sweden. Uh, well, I'm not sure if it's correct, 1944 or 1943, there are different numbers, uh, but uh, it doesn't matter. That was, um, uh, well, war was going on, Second World War was going on, and um, in order to um, uh, uh, avoid to be taken into Red Army, he uh, was able to escape or fled, uh, uh, flee uh, uh, Estonia and then um, ended up in, in Sweden. So, and um, his entire professional career was uh, in Sweden. He graduated uh, um, uh, at uh, Karolinska Institute in, in medicine. Um, and then later in 1949, he defended his uh, doctoral thesis at Karolinska, or basically he stayed the full uh, life at, at Karolinska. Uh, 1950, he, he became a docent. Uh, 1970, he became associate professor and also head of the uh, laboratory. And uh, uh, 1979, he, uh, nine, he became full professor in biochemistry. Um, well, he retired in uh, 1989, but still continued um, uh, almost, yeah, well, almost for, te for 10 years until he passed away, uh, or basically in, uh, in the laboratory, having his white coat on uh, and uh, doing uh, work uh, uh, at, at Karolinska Institute. So and now, uh, what, uh, uh, what he was doing? Well, uh, uh, I'm sure many or most of us know that he was working on uh, peptides. So um, uh, he defended his uh, PhD uh, thesis uh, or some purification of secretin, uh, first peptide. And then um, his career actually um, was, I mean, his full career was about peptides. So he uh, discovered or was um, uh, well involved in, in discovery of over 50 uh, biologically active peptides. Well, that's a huge number. And, and um, uh, I mean, at that, I mean, that time, peptides were uh, not, uh, well, their functions, actions were not, uh, of course, very well known. But uh, today we were here lot more uh, about, uh, uh, about peptides and also about uh, uh, neuropeptides. So, uh, peptides, peptides, peptides. Here is some list of um, the peptides um, uh, uh, Victor uh, has been working with, uh, uh, with secretines. Uh, well, I will not read this, all, all these peptides up. Uh, there is also uh, uh, the last peptide name is galanine. Um, I myself um, uh, did my PhD studies under the supervision of Professor Thomas Partfei, who is um, with us here today, and will talk, uh, who will talk more about um, uh, about Kalanin and, and other peptides um, uh, as well. So um, Kalanin was, uh, uh, if now I'm not good at history, but I'm trying to um, recall. I think Kalanin was first published in 1982. <laughs> Um, by Tatemoto and, uh, and, and uh, Mut, and then a um, uh, few years later, Galanina Sidin uh, was, uh, was cloned. So, uh, about uh, some recognitions. Uh, uh, so, Victor was a member of uh, Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences. He was a foreign associate of the American National Academy of Sciences. Um, he uh, uh, is honorary doctor of the University of Tartu, although he has uh, not been working in uh, uh, Tartu University. But he's, uh, well, Tartu is a kind of hometown uh, for him where he um, uh, finished his uh, high school. Um, he has received uh, well, several and also major European awards and also in the United States. Uh, he has uh, uh, received uh, uh, very prestigious uh, awards. And um, last but not least, has, he has been nominated for the Nobel Prize, although uh, not uh, uh, obtained the uh, prize. But um, uh, uh, being uh, nominated for a Nobel Prize is, uh, uh, is definitely uh, very prestigious. And uh, well, once again, uh, thinking how many Estonians or Estonian scientists have been uh, uh, research have been nominated for Nobel Prize. So probably only a few. So, um, um, I will now, and then, uh, well, uh, to finish, um, I want to start with my uh, short um, talk. I, I mentioned that I, uh, yes, I do have uh, uh, my own personal experience or uh, with contact with uh, Victor Mutt and also well, direct and indirect. I mentioned about um, the galanin peptide, 
which was discovered, isolated by, by Victor. And uh, now when I go back to um, uh, 1989, uh, November 7th, so uh, that was uh, when I first time uh, visited or was able to, that was still Soviet time. Here, here in Estonia, everything was quite different here. And I was, um, uh, well, thanks to Ulo and, and Tamas, I was uh, uh, able or somehow invited to um, uh, go to Tamas lab in, uh, at Stockholm University. Then uh, somehow Ulo had um, uh, well, organized or um, uh, with Victor that uh, I could stay the f basically one month, a little, little bit more than one month in um, the guest room of uh, Karolinska Institute in the lab of uh, Victor. So I remember first when I uh, uh, went to Stockholm and went to, um, uh, well, I took a ferry to Stockholm from Helsinki, because there were no ferries from Tallinn to Helsinki, no, uh, no, no uh, uh, flights either. And um, we went to Karolinska Institute, and of course, first uh, person I met was Victor. He was around everywhere. He had his white coat uh, on, and uh, he was going around, um, and um, uh, that was my, my very first uh, contact in Sweden, Stockholm, when I first went to Stockholm. So, and then I came, went to the uh, Tamas lab, and then met Tamas. So. Um, um, uh, so once um, again, I, um, uh, I would like to thank Ulo and, and, and Jaak for organizing this event. And um, uh, it's uh, really great that both Tamas and Thomas Höckfeldt are here today. Uh, we'll uh, talk about um, uh, work uh, related to um, uh, Victor Mutt. And I wish you all a nice seminar, nice conference and uh, fruitful discussions. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, and it's my pleasure to announce now um, the keynote lecture about uh, four decades of research with focus on Victor's Mutt uh, neuropeptides by Thomas Schreckfeld, and from the position of academy, most important is that he's a member of the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences, and of course, Academy and European, all other small academies. Welcome. Thank you. President, Rector, uh, academicians, uh, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great honor and pleasure indeed to be invited and I thank uh, uh, Professor Jörv and Ulo for uh, this invitation. Um, uh, it it's, it's, it's also feels very good to honor Victor in this way, who has um, given me so much work to do, <laughs> you could say, and so many other people work to do. And uh, therefore he is uh, really unique, I must say. Now, um, what I really thank you for is to remind me about the fact that Victor would have become 100 years last year. Uh, to be honest, I had not remember that. And I think that hardly anyone in Stockholm brought that up. So it was uh, uh, Jörg's and Ulo's initiative that brought this to my mind. And Tamas was around and he said, Thomas, we have to do something about this in Stockholm. <laughs> and, and as you see, now we have done something. So we have an organizing committee with Birgitta Agerbert, who was closely working in Victor's group for many years, and Tamas Batfai, of course, and um, Hans Jönvall, who is a senior uh, chem biochemist since many, many years. Uh, he was, had his own group, but uh, he worked uh, with Victor. And then we have two young people, Pet Bergman, who is a student of uh, Birgitta Agerbert, and Christian Broberger, who is my student. So, as you can see here, it will be September 26, 27, and um, uh, if you're interested in uh, coming, you, you may uh, uh, send me a mail, you have the mail address there, or to Catherine, a travel team, 
Uh, we, we will make a list and, and uh, give personal invitations, but we can unfortunately not give any financial support for, for the travel. But I think it will be a very exciting event. We have invited 16 outstanding uh, scientists who all worked, or most of them worked with Victor's peptides. So we will get an up-to-date what is happening in, with Victor's peptides at that occasion. Now, um, there are many peptides, as we heard. Victor has discovered quite a lot of them. Uh, I, I have um, this uh, list here from uh, Peter Burbach's paper from 2010. It's not really up, very up to date, but he describes the different gene families. I've also included David David, who often is called the father of neuropeptides because he was one who advanced uh, studies, experimental studies in animals on the role of peptides in behavior. And actually, his work was not very much appreciated, especially on the other side of the Atlantic. But uh, I think it turned out that much of what he did was quite advanced, and behavioral studies are not easy to reproduce unless you do it in the right way. So I think he deserves to be here. This little box uh, on the right hand side shows. A pap some papers where they have studied where actually did peptides first appear in the nervous system. And they uh, here say that it's in the jellyfish, and there the neurotransmitters in that very simple nervous system were all peptides. No GABA, no glutamate, no mon monamines. And I think that gives some sort of historical perspective on the significance of neuropeptides, which not always have been so much appreciated. Now, um, here you see Victor in the middle, uh, in his little office. You know, at those days, when you visited a professor at Karolinska, you were first introduced to his secretary, who was sitting in the office outside the professor. You entered uh, the professor room, and after two minutes, the secretary came in with a tea and little cakes and so on but never Victor. This was such a narrow little room, so when Tamash and I, or Shel Fuchs and I were there, we could not sit side by side. I had to sit behind Shell, you know, to look over his shoulder to say hello to Victor. <laughs> so um, that is a special um, memory, of course. Victor was very special. There is no student to whom he lectured who has forgotten him. Why? Because he was so fascinating? No, because he wrote with his right hand the formulas, and in the second, he wiped it out. So you really had to be alert, and you never forget that lecture, because if you weren't alert, you have lost your possibility to make the notes. I also worked together with Victor in the Nobel Committee for many years, and Victor was very special also there. Uh, as you probably know, the price is dependent on uh, the uh, many, many evaluations before it is awarded by different people, and Victor made many such evaluations. The thing was, in those days, that you, these pages could, could be 30 pages, so it was quite very thorough, and no one made it th more thorough than Victor. And he also has this other little thing, because in those days, you got paid for the number of pages from the Nobel Committee. <laughs> and so, of course, I didn't write very many, and, but it was to get many pages, you introduced pictures, figures from the literature. So in this way, your honorarium increased, increased. But Victor, as a demonstration, I think, he never had any of that. He had single spaced, and he used all the page out to the edge to make a little a demonstration of that he thought how uh, um, evaluation should be. Now, Victor's peptides were not the first ones, as you may uh, imagine when you see this, that I worked with. Instead, it was substance P, which had a very long history at Karolinska because Ulf von Euler, Euler, the Nobel laureate, he discovered substance P when he was in UK working with Gadam in 1931. Then uh, Bengt Pano, who 
later became rector at Karolinska, uh, made his thesis with von Euler on substance P. But in 1971, Susan Lehman uh, discovered what actually substance P is, because up till when it was just a powder. And um, that started a whole new era where I was involved. And uh, because I got antibodies against these uh, peptides, and I could do immunohistochemistry. And the first tissue that I studied was uh, spinal cord, because one had this idea that substance P is a transmitter in sensory and neurons, perhaps a pain transmitter. And our work supported that, really. And uh, we were very excited, and one thought that if you just can get the substance P antagonist, you will solve the pain problems because substance P was acting in the dorsal horn and released from these sensory neurons. And a lot of things happened with substance P, as you see on the next slide. And uh, the, 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 the um, uh, receptors were found and cloned. And uh, one was looking for a substance P antagonist that would enter the brain, the spinal cord, and would block the pain signaling. But as you see here on the next slide, when it finally such a compound was found in a drug company, uh, it didn't work. It didn't attenuate pain. So a big, really big disappointment also for me, you know. And moreover, next step was that one could show that the substance P antagonist is efficient in, in, um, in, in, um, in depression. But again, when uh, that went to a bigger study, it also failed there. So there was really major disappointment also in the drug companies. And one started to doubt if neuropeptides are of interest at all. And there were many people who were critical. And that paper to the right here, you know, superfluous neurotransmitters. I mean, that was not nice. And Arvid Kalsom, whom I admire, who didn't like neuropeptides, he got water on his uh, mill, you know, saying that neuropeptides. And Bowers, who wrote this, was not any type. He had been working in, in Cooper's laboratory. And uh, so, you know, this was a big hit for me. Nevertheless, uh, we worked on neuropeptides. And there were, in the early phases, many things we were wondering about. Because classically, uh, the peptide, the, the neurotransmitters, are released from nerve endings uh, at the end of the action. Now, um, peptides, uh, because they can be produced in nerve endings, so that was not a major problem. But peptides, we thought, had to be produced in the cell bodies. And in the human body, nerves can be like a meter long from the hip to the toe. So if a peptide molecule is released from the nerve endings, it could take days until it can be replaced by new synthesis in the cell body and transport into the nerve endings. So then things happened that uh, kind of a little bit explained. Mike Ludwig, uh, he showed that peptides are released from dendrites. And of course, then the distance from synthesis to release is very short, so that's OK. And more recently, uh, Irene Schumann has shown that actually mRNA for the peptides is present in the nerve endings. So maybe there is a local synthesis of, 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 of peptides. So that kind of got rid of several of these questions over the years. Now, the perhaps most important finding we did was that neuropeptides are always present in the same neurons as also produce um, the classic transmitters like noradrenaline, like glutamate and GABA, and so on and so on. But the first example was this noradrenaline somatostatin coexistence. And uh, thanks to my um, student, Jan Lundberg, who had a very successful, has had a very successful career, he became head of global research for AstraZeneca, and later on, Eli Lilly. So 
what we found in those days was that the peptides are different from the classic transmitters, also because of where they are stored. And I don't can, I hope you can see that uh, on the top there to the left, peptides are stored in a special type of vesicles. So they are, have a different storage place from the classic transmitters like noradrenaline and GABA and glutamate and so on. And that also meant there is a possibility that peptides are, are released under different conditions. And what John could show in his thesis work was that actually only when neurons are firing at a high rate intensely, then peptides are released. And that's why, of course, if you look at a normal animal where nothing happens, if you knock out the peptide, you don't see anything because normally they are not at all uh, used. It's under certain conditions that peptides are coming into place. Now, all this work that we did in the early days uh, uh, led to an invitation to write a review in Nature. I, I was not so happy about that because I thought nature has such a lousy paper and they reproduce reference micrographs in a very bad way. So the editor had to remind me three times to Höckfeldt, are you going to write it or not? <laughs> Finally, we did it, fortunately, because this is my most cited paper ever. In any case, uh, 10 years later, I thought it's time to follow up to tell people what happened during the last 10 years. So in 1990, I, we, and I actually didn't ask, I just submitted the manuscript because I thought they were going to be so happy to accept this manuscript. Now what we wrote in that paper was um, to the left here in the 50s, if the 50s were the decade of acetylcholine, the 60s of catecholamines and serotonin, the 70s of GABA and glycines, we thought that the 80s would be the peptide decade. But, and then I rewrote, unfortunately, instead, excitator amino acid entered the scene and grabs the attention with the implications for learning and memory and for involvement in brain pathology. So after some time, we got um, a response from nature. And here is what the editor wrote. First, the bad news. They cannot publish us. But then, here at the end, what I have said, instead, the excitatory amino acid entered the scene and grasped the attention. And then the editor says, if contrary to expectation, excitatory amino acid really were the big thing in the 80s, I feel that the review article should focus on these more and less exclusively. <laughs> so that was a blow in the, in the head, yeah. Now, fortunately, the paper could be published then in neurons, thanks to Eris Kandel, actually, he was very kind. So we could tell what happened during these 10 years. But this was also the time then when we turned to Victor's peptide, that is galanine. And um, here's a summary of, of, of I, I, uh, you know, the various species, very similar. And there are also some new members of the galanine family now. But basically what we have done over the years is to study the role of galanine in, in pain signaling, depression, especially related to locus ceruleus, and also in the human brain. In, 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 um, you know, um, sometimes the important findings for yourself in any case are not the big important journals who publish that. This little paper uh, from 1987, uh, uh, this is the reason why we were interested in galanine and pain. And it was published in Neuroscience Letters, Impact Factor 2. Now, what happened there is shown here. What really attracted our attention was that if we looked to the left on galanine in a normal dorsal root ganglion, that's uh, these cells which have substance P also that I told you. But if you cut the sciatic nerve, then you see to the right that at least half of all neurons suddenly produce high amounts of galanine. And we felt this must mean something. So this is what we have been working a lot on together, especially with Susanna wiesenfeld Halin. And uh, what we believe in brief is that 
Galanin is an endogenous analgesic. So when the nerve is damaged, it upregulates galanin as a protective mechanism against pain. At the same time, the two other peptides, sepsin and CGRP, which are excitatory and that produce pain, are downregulated. So um, a little bit, and, and so that was, I think, the first time that one uh, so, uh, proposed that there is an endogenous pain system in the dorsal root ganglia. As you see here, the, to the left down, the first endogenous anti-nociceptive systems are the dorsal horn neurons, which produce encephalin. That was known since many years, but that the DRG neurons themselves, when they get wounded, when they get damaged, upregulates an anti-nociceptive peptide. We think that could be misported. So that opened up for ideas about treatment and so on. And there was confusing evidence that galanin also actually induced pain. That was solved by a, a Chinese um, a guest scientist, uh, Ruby, to the right up. Uh, because what she could show was that actually this pronociceptive of effect of galanin, which occurs in the beginning, that is causing pain, uh, is exerted via one of the three receptors, galar 3. Whereas the second, and what I've been talking about, the anti nociceptive effect was associated with galar 1 which was present in interneurons in the dorsal horn. Now, of course, if you talk about treatment, you would like really to be able to know what is in the human ganglia, in the human spinal cord, because we treat humans and not rats. So, um, I have checked two recent papers uh, in the literature one from Price and one from Patrick Anforce at Karolinska. And they have completely different um, results from the single cell analysis. So the first study can only demonstrate GALA3 in human dorsal root ganglia. The second one can show galanin, but not any of the receptors. And that reminded me of some results that my student, my, my postdoc a student, found many years ago. She came to me with this uh, fi figure showing that virtually every cell in dorsal root ganglia has DRG, has a galanin R3. And that's confirmed with some, some, some um, uh, RC, QPCR. So I don't know. Uh, in any case, our hypothesis about GALAR1 and GALAR2 seems pretty shaky as it is now. And uh, if we want to really go through, we have to solve the problem, which is the receptor that is important. So um, now we go to major depression. Um, is this 40 minutes? Did I speak 40 minutes already? No, okay, I see 40 minutes here. So uh, now we turn to depression. And we have a group, I, I'm not explaining what depression is, I think everyone knows a bit about that. Here is the people who have worked with uh, us on, on, on depression. And the reason we became interested was the finding by Tourmelander in his thesis that the locus ceruleus neurons have galanin. As you can see here, to the left, to the, here, that uh, galanin is green, tyrosine hydroxylase is red, and that virtually every galanin positive cell is an ordinary cell. And Vicky Hollitz followed up, and uh, she could also serve that NPY, Victor's other peptides, again is present in population of dorsal root ganglion neurons, but not as many as uh, uh, for galanin. So we did electrophysiology, and uh, I'm just going to focus on the upper left corner. 
And this was actually has been shown before by other groups. But what is clear is that galanin inhibits the spontaneous firing of um, this locus ceruleus, neuronal locus ceruleus neurons. If we put on a gala two or three agonists, nothing happened. So it seemed to be something to have to do with, um, with the gala one. Now, many groups have uh, worked on this issue on, on depression and galanin. I've listed them, Tamash, Ulu, and so on. So, so we, but, but in conclusion, what we have thought, based on rat experiments, is that galanin inhibits firing of nordic neurons, possibly after release from dendrites, as I said, we know may occur. And this is some sort of emergency break. So when the noradrenaline neurons fire too much, galanin is created and dampens the activity. However, it's um, not as simple as that. So if, if this is true, then galar 1 is pro-depressive. And Thomas has provided good evidence that galar 2 is the opposite, antidepressive. So in any case, one can suggest uh, agonist, antagonist, and so on, to treat uh, depression. More recently, many studies, many groups have been, become interested in locus cerebrius. And actually, they have told Thomas Höckfeldt that he is wrong. So we thought that we have to redo some experiments. Everything else so far was galanin. And now we have done uh, work on the mouse locus cerebrius. And uh, here you see Martino Carami, you know, the, the Caramia, the, the, the Italian uh, postdoc, and uh, Roman Romanov and Tibor Harkin have been working on this. And uh, you can see that uh, here that tyrosine hydroxylase is green, galanin is red, just as in red. So almost all uh, locus ruleus are galanin positive. But in contrast to red, no NPY is present. But also, if you look up in the left right corner, you see that what galanin does is to um, reduce firing. So that is similar in mouse and rat. What we did further was what Tibor did further, further was to also do single cell analysis of locus ceruleus. And uh, I'm not going into the details here. Uh, you can see here on the next slide what it looks like when you do in situ hybridization and you can see that um, uh, the cells have for example gastrin release and peptide they have a uh, caught peptide but what surprised us was actually that there are so many peptides in the locus cerulus we have been talking about gallon in NPY for 20 30 years and now you can see that there are so many more peptides and so many more res peptide receptors than we thought. So we are wondering, have you been climbing up the wrong tree? Maybe there is some peptide that is much more interesting than galanin and NPY. I hope also for Victor that galanin and NPY still are interesting. We will see. Again, um, oh yeah, sorry, sorry. No, no, I'm, again, uh, as said, for the peptides, for the pain studies, the real interesting thing is what happens in the human brain. So we have a group that has been working on, on um, the human brain and um, locus ceruleus especially. Uh, and uh, here you see what locus ceruleus looks like. You can see two dark dots a bit above the arrows. You can see the locus ceruleus by your eye because it has so much pigment that it is black. So that is not no difficulty to, to... And this nucleus project all over the brain, also to the spinal cord. Now I want really to show this slide here, or, or two slides, using another technique, not immunohistochemistry, but using a new type of microscope, which is a light sheet microscope, where you can show the whole three-dimensional uh, uh, extent of a nucleus with immunohistochemistry. 
And this work has been done by Shaba Dori from Hungary. It's a fantastic work that he has done virtually alone. But of course, there are 15 authors on the paper, <laughs> as usual nowadays, too. In any case, uh, you see that the upper row, the three upper panels, is from a normal brain stain for tyrosine hydroxylase. The lower panel is from an Alzheimer brain stained for tau, this protein that is increasing in the Alzheimer brain. Now, I just have taken the two high power magnifications here, and you see a buff healthy neurodynodic neuron stained with tyrosine hydroxylase. And this in red, you see how lousy the neurons look when you have Alzheimer's. This is about the same magnification. What remains of these wonderful, beautiful, grayish neurons are some, de some, some de debris of neurons, you know. So you understand that you're not well. In any case, uh, this, we, we had planned to do this on, on, on depressed patients and so on, but all this has disappeared because Shabba has left and so on, so this we cannot do. In any case, what we really started with was just to do simple in seed hybridization on local cellulose, human cellulose, and we could confirm that in the middle too, that galan is produced there, and we also saw galan 3 uh, with our probes. Again, we recently have had possibilities to look at single cell uh, analysis of um, the locus cerulius, thanks to Eva Hedlund, who is working on ALS, uh, the C on ALS disease. And here you can see again what an enormous number of peptides uh, are expressed in the human locus cerulius. You see, 56 peptides were detected. <laughs> and what was very interesting was the box here in red, where you see that also some of these neurons have glutamate. So they are not only neurodynergic, peptidergic, but also glutamatergic. We have also looked at the human frontal cortex, prefrontal cortex, which is of course a region of major importance in the human brain for decision, for for, 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 you, for, for emotions and so on. This was thanks to two persons, especially Miki Palkowitz in Budapest, who has a brain bank, who is the master of micro dissections of brain. What he has done is he has micro dissected 17 subregions of the prefrontal cortex. And thanks to Matthias Ullin, uh, who paid for this big study, it's not a single cell study, it's a bulk study. But in any case, we have, as you see on the next slide, uh, you see we have so much data here, you, you just cannot think about it. When Song and Swapnali Birds, uh, Birds were the people who worked on that. But I want to take out three things from this study. First, that with bulk studies, compared to single cell studies, we see more peptides than uh, with our approach. Then I want to just show you some in situ hybridization on the distributional peptides. And then I want to show you some evidence that peripheral peptides produced in fat cells and uh, intestine, that they can have an effect in the brain. So here is an example, adrenomedullin, which is a, a plenty of peptides and which we have seen in here, the lower left here, uh, adrenomedullin. But in the single cell analysis reference, they don't detect that. And all these neuropeptides, they cannot detect uh, with single cell. Same thing with, with, with receptors. So, I mean, I'm saying this because our paper was rejected in three journals because it, we didn't use single cell. So they kind of failed to appreciate that there's some advantages with this bulk, not single cell, namely that we have a higher sensitivity. We have done then in situ hybridization, and you can easily see here 
that um, one of the most, uh, that is the most uh, important and abundant peptide in cortex is Victor Mutz cholecystokinin. You see uh, the dense here network. And actually, when we double stain for glutamate and GABA, it turns out that many of the neurons are glutamatergic pyramidal neurons, but also some are GABAergic. I, I, I skip the, the high power magnification here. We also could actually demonstrate galanin and galanin peptides uh, receptor transcripts. And as you see here, the galanin is coexisting with VGLUT1, that is a glutamatergic neuron, and in, in some with, uh, with galanin, galar1, and galar3. They all can be detected in human cortex and they coexist with glutamate or GABA, especially glutamate. Now, this was a bit surprise for me because when we look at the rat brain, uh, galanin can hardly be detected. So we believe that maybe galanin is more important in human cortex, in human brain, than in the uh, rat brain. We can also construct a scene here, some uh, circuitry, microcircuitry, which I'm not going into. And then the third thing I wanted to demonstrate here is that Peptides are produced in cells, in the intestine, in fat, the most important one, perhaps leptin, and, but also adiponectin is another fat peptide. Now, when we look in the prefrontal cortex for receptors and peptides, what we find are very high levels of, adip of the adiponectin one receptor, but we don't find adiponectin itself. So what are all these receptors doing? Much more, much higher than the CCK receptors, which is the main peptide in the brain. Is it really true that they can be transported from the blood, past the blood-brain barrier, and have an effect in the prefrontal cortex? We, we cannot have any other explanation than that's the case. Since the receptors for peptides are so sensitive, they only need nanomolar concentrations. It's possible that even if one or two percent of the peptide pass the blood barrier, that may be of functional significance for our activity in the prefrontal cortex. So finally, I want to say, uh, show you some results from um, studies on postmortem brains from depressed patients. That is patients that have committed suicide. And there we have looked uh, uh, on different regions, prefrontal cortex, locus ceruleus, and so on. And this is thanks to Nagib Meshavar, who has a brain bank in Canada. And the person who did this work is Swapnali Bard. Uh, I'm just showing uh, this slide. And what you see here, basically, if we look to the left, lateral prefrontal cortex. You see arrows and you see uh, the various peptide substance P receptors, MPY receptors, galanin receptors. And you can see that um, they are increased mostly. So there are differences in expression in the depressed brains versus control brains. And interestingly, when we measured DNA methylation, if you look at the left panel again in the left box, I have a thick, uh, big, upregulated peptide for the methylated for galanin. And this is what we expect, that when, um, when there is the, the methylation goes up, then um, the levels go down in that particular case. So we, we, in any case, the message, home message, take home message is that in the human brain, there are, uh, in depressed patients, changes in levels of peptide and peptide receptors. We have even been able to do a genetic study when we had a, a grant from a uh, European, New Mood. And um, the conclusion from that is that the galanin, I read here, system plays a significant role in the pathogenesis of depression almost entirely by modulating the vulnerability 
to early and recent psychosocial stress, possibly involving all three uh, galani receptors. Again, this paper was studied was thanks to your Hungarian, especially Hungarian collaborators, Gabriele Juhas and Georgi Bagdi. And this just uh, is a little bit summary of, of uh, the, the um, genetic results. So uh, if I may summarize, and now I'm almost at the end, some conclusion regarding galanin and depression. Uh, the top here is saying that galanin in the anterior cingulate cortex counteracts excessive glutamate release. So here we have a situation where galanin and glutamate coexist, but the coexisting molecules are antagonistic. It's actually the same in noradrenaline neurons that uh, galanin and noradrenaline are antagonistic. But now we also know that in the human brain they are glutamatergic. Why is this interesting? Because um, the most recent treatment of depression is with the drug ketamine, which is a glutamate antagonist. So this means, and, and all focus has been on glutamate ketamine in the forebrain for treatment. That's why the effect is. But now that also the locus cerulis neurons may be um, glutamatergic, maybe ketamine has another target in the lower brainstem. And now I'm almost at the end. Because I want to say that even if the journey with peptides has been a tough journey because there has been so much resistance and people have not been thinking that peptides have any are of any significance, there are now still several drugs on the market FDA approved. And these are the ones I have listed here. The most important and interesting one, I think, are the anti-CGRP antibodies or CGRP antagonists. CGRP is a peptide that is present in many dorsal root ganglion neurons together with substance P. And now these antibodies are used for treatment of galanin or these antagonists. This is a major um, step forward for migraine patients, which is a disease that many, many people suffer. The other drug on the market is uh, orexin hypocretin antagonists, which are used for treatment of insomnia. And uh, it so turned out that the NK1 antagonist that was not efficient in depression actually counteracts emesis. And so that is sold on the market also. And there are actually even more things coming up on the horizon. Uh, for example, here I have list three papers where they say that these orexin hypocretin antagonists that are good for uh, insomnia, helps you to fall asleep, they may have something good in the treatment of narcolepsy, in Alzheimer's disease, and in epilepsy. We never know. So I think that now we see the beginning of a new era. Maybe the 2020s are the uh, decennium, decade of the peptides, neuropeptides. So in any case, uh, when we started, um, we, we had the situation with the wheel, which was incomplete. I was close to a breakthrough when the grant money ran out, which happened to many people working on the galanin, actually. I have several colleagues who have told me they cannot work on galanin because they don't get any more money for galanin research. So nowadays it looks a little bit better. It's not full the wheel, but still it's uh, quite a bit on the way. Of course, I have had over the years many collaborators. I mean, I, I just cannot count them. And um, this photo was from uh, maybe 20 years ago when I had a big group. Nowadays, it, it over the years, uh, they got um, smaller and smaller and very small. But as I told you, 
I'm working with uh, very powerful people like Tibor, um, Tibor Tarkani and Matthias Ullén, and I always get good advice uh, from Tamas Bartfai. He has over the years been so helpful and actually suggested many changes in the di direction of, of my, my, my or our research. So um, thank you very much for listening. Thank you and for inviting. Yeah, yeah, okay. so, sorry. so thank you very much for this um, fantastic lecture. We have time for questions, so if uh, there are some. Yeah, Mart. So <clears throat> there have been thank you. There have been a couple of interesting papers showing that galanine inhibits tyrosine hydroxylase in, uh, in nigral dopamine neurons. Uh, wh what do you think about this data? Okay, I, I stand here instead, yeah. Uh, well, I, I mean, this is not my field, and uh, I think you should ask Tamash what he thinks about it. But, um, you know, I mean, the, the, these peptides, they do almost everything. If you just look careful and long enough, you will find things. Tamas, maybe, do you want to respond? So, so the, the enzyme SF3 studies in which you would look for a classical inhibitor of an enzyme in, uh, are, are very inconclusive. You would not use an inhibitor which have so low Ki value. Okay. It is in 10 micromolar to 0.1 micromolar, yeah. very large no, variable. No, 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 no. Um, the ones which Thomas mentioned go the direction that in some cells expressing galani receptor, uh, tyrosine hydroxylase expression is reduced, and therefore tyrosine hydroxylase activity is reduced. But that's at a cellular level, and what the circuitry is, Different. If you ask straight out, is it is like trypsin and trypsin inhibitor? No. <laughs> but I mean, since the tyrosine hydroxylase protein levels are very high in neurons, in the same neurons, it's an extracellular enzyme, extra vesicular uh, cytoplasmic enzyme, sorry. So, you know, why not? One micromolar is not an impressive inhibitor. Yeah. Oh. What would you say today? Well, I, I, I would say, why, why not 200? <laughs> Do we have evidence? I wouldn't be. If, if Victor has discovered 50, and if, uh, uh, you know, if you go to some other of the big labs that discovered many things, like in Italy, uh, then of course uh, they, they, they can add it easily 50 more. And, and then if you have break prone products and um, active fragments and so on, so on, so on. So, so, I mean, I think it's really not such an interesting question. It's, uh, there are enough. <laughs> you know, if, if you twist the question as pharma does, how many drug targets are related to neuropeptides, then the estimate is somewhere around 500 to 1,000, because just think of galanin having three receptor subtypes clearly, NPY having five already identified. So not only are the peptides themselves have pharmacological effects, but they are different at different receptor subtypes, so as for noradrenaline, you would not want to give somebody an alpha-2 agonist who needs a beta-1 antagonist, and so So the number of drug targets, we are talking of close to a 1,000. And this does not include the peptidase inhibitors, of which some, like Januvia, a trivial depeptid for 
inhibitor is selling for 1.2 billion dollars, which I don't care very much about. What I care about that it is the most common type 2 diabetes drug right now. More common than any other. So more questions? Then I take uh, freedom and ask one. Normally for receptors there are agonists and antagonists. Is there some kind of uh, clarity what type of peptides can be agonists and what type of peptides can be antagonists? Well, I, I, th I think that there is... Um, Anyone can be both, you know, I mean, it's, uh, that's my feeling and um, I mean, what, 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 what the big thing is, if you talk about treatment as I see it, is if you, if the correct treatment is an antagonist, that's a much better situation than if you need to develop an agonist. For example, the, the John Yu spent years to develop a small molecule CCK agonist to treat food uh, intake, you know, and uh, they didn't succeed really to, to... And then of course you have the morphine situation that an agonist, if it passes the blood-brain barrier, will reach all receptors in the whole nervous system. And of course the galanin receptors are everywhere, so then you, just as for morphine, the, you know, you can have a lot of side effects. So, um, so that's what worries me, that for treatment of pain at the spinal level, you need a GALAR1 agonist. Of course, if... Uh, so, so, I mean, we're still working with it to see uh, about galanin and NPY and pain and so on. Uh, if, uh, I mean, if people really have a lot of pain, it's relevant to do intrathecal injections in just at, at the spinal cord level, of course. If you get an effect that lasts for longer than three, four, five hours, then you have a different situation. And, uh, but of course, still, if you can administer peripherally, then of course, it's, it's very much easier, everything. On the other hand, maybe you have a lot of side effects. But I mean, I have always had this feeling that it is only when systems are disturbed that they are um, available for, th uh, for therapeutic attacks, so to say, you know. If there's no, if they norm work normally, then there's no, not so much to do, so, so I don't know. No, no. Okay, thank you. Thank you uh, once more. <laughs> Now we have um, our next speaker, Tamas Bartvai. And Tamas, would you like to have this microphone? I don't think that I, I, because I this will need one. And you, you will have to um, accept my thanks for the invitation. I have been most uh, often reminded being from Utan Farika to Sverige, but no one person who has ever that they were Victor Motta Thomas Hökvart, or the most uh, wonderful summer that I've ever met. So in English, I am extremely, extremely lucky that I have been able to work with Thomas Hökvert, who took me to Victor Mott. And Victor Mott looked at me behind that enormous piles of, of papers and said to me, I like Thomas, who was sitting in front of me. <laughs> I only could see Thomas, think, because he makes beautiful pictures and he is not rushing with telling me what they mean. He is telling me what he finds, where he finds them. And I thought that this picture, which I have been 
in possession of because we, Thomas Hockfart gave it to me. It has many, many interesting people on it. Um, as you will see, First, in the first row, and this picture has so many people who have been making major contributions to neuroscience. Eccles. Here we have Thomas Hockfeld, you just heard. I don't think I have to make a plea for that he has made his share. Pernov, who worked for von Euler and has been an extremely important neuroscientist at the Karolinska. Floyd Bloom, editor of chief, editor in chief of science, I became the successor of, and who said, if you were good enough for Hockfeld and what I'm sure you should be my successor. And trust me, there were many people who wanted to get the department which was moving between Salk and Scripps. And it was only the question of where you want to be. I was asked, where do you want to be? And I said, well, I don't know. I have to ask the Karolinska because they appointed me to bank someone's on chair. And the Karolinska said, being Hans said, you can choose any one of them, they are fine. <laughs> and under one condition, you don't resign at the Karolinska. And I said, why? He said, nobody ever resigns from the Berzelius chair. So, and as you see, somebody could lose a hair in peptide research. Here is Jean-Pierre jean Jan Lundberg, whom you have heard of, Costa, Manek Goldstein, who has been not only a wonderful mentor to Fuchse, Höckfeldt, and many others, but who has done an incredible work, very modestly always. The only person as modest as Victor is Manek. I really will, unlike Thomas, from a perspective of a biochemist, talk about why it was so remarkable and remarkably successful, the work of Victor Mutt. Here you see a man who worked on an extremely commonly occurring neurotransmitter. Nobody believed him. They ridiculed him first. It's Bernstock, purinergic transmission. Do you mean that ATP is a transmitter now all of a sudden? This was the first question before he entered the room fully. So, but he survived. This is Marian Schultz by Lars Terenius. Just uh, so Eric Kandel. So as you see, this is a picture important to have if you ever have a, a publication. Maybe Thomas has the copyright of it. He made it or he has had it made. But I am very, very fond of this. This is the only picture which I took from every, every place I worked. First, it came up on the wall at Yale in the room of Ricci. And Ricci is fundamental to neuroscience because he discovered the voltage-sensitive sodium channel. And without that, there is no excitability. <laughs> And when I, when I came there, he said, did you bring some luggage? I said, yeah, I brought my three-year-old, a three-month-old daughter, my clogs, and this picture. <laughs> so he said, I would like to have it. So under a while, it was hanging at Yale in Richie's room. At that time, Kendall was no Nobel laureate, and Floyd was very, very important at St. Elizabeth. But in his room, Victor was the most important because he produced 
as a very modest, incredibly diligent, and not ever commanding, but always advising colleague. Now, as a biochemist, you will understand that the main issue is that if you want to do something which had to do, with, and you have to remember, with purification and sequencing, and you have heard about Jörn Wall. Jörn Wall has sequenced almost everything what Victor Muth has um, purified to homogeneity together with your pass. And before you think that he hasn't been involved with industry, Vitrum, which was responsible for insulin production for Sweden, in which was later incorporated to Kabi Vitrum, was a company of Jorpes and Mutt. So he, he did understand it. He just was not interested in companies and money. He lived in his rental apartment with Begitta, which I often visited, and was by far the most modest, significant scientist I knew. I did not know a nicer, more modest man. But as a biochemist, you will understand that the main issue is that if you want to identify and purify and sequence things, then you need a lot of starting material. This has put him into a very complicated place. The only two people who have used such enormous amount of starting material to isolate a peptide were Andrew Shiley and Rojamin Guillemin, who have isolated the hypophysa releasing factors. They each used the one and a half million hypotheses of sheep. Now, it's important that Victor used porcine. Using sheep or porcine, species whom we humans consume permitted that if you isolated something, there was no committee on us who would prevent you from injecting it to humans and look for is there any biological effect or any pharmacological effect. It was incredibly much smarter than isolate the same thing from angler fish or puffer fish, which would kill, kill a human. You isolated it from porcine, probably millions of humans have been exposed to it already. It was incredibly smart. Nobody at that time thought about it. And why I think that this is so important for us is to remember Victor because he was an extremely clever biochemist who has worked on a set of peptides which at the beginning were only considered, if anything, as hormones. But the known peptide hormones immediately brought into the imagination and the knowledge of all physiologists insulin. And that's very big compared to the peptides which Victor worked with. The second problem was that, as we all learned, insulin is made as a pro-hormone. And there are several enzymes needed to cut and to remove the C-peptide. So it is fair to say that, that while somatostatin was known through the work of Roger Guillamin, who was on Saturdays 100 years, as you see, we are watching a generation here, a generation of giants. And when I said that there are roughly 1,000 a a thousand, uh, drug targets, I should also say that when I entered Roger's vice president, there was a sign which my predecessor left, and it said, safe drugs find many applications. So if of the thousand drug targets, 50 will be well drugged, that will mean 200 indications in which it will be used. This is how it will be. So the significance of this is far beyond what you can see today. And maybe teeth and Ulo got a little discouraged by that not yet 
there is a drug and kalanin, but kalanin was a fantastically good project to train on because you were one of the first ones to do an LLA mapping of pharmacophores of a longer peptide. It has become a strategy which is used today everywhere. They do it now, not by synthesis, but by mutation. But that comes from your work, did. <laughs> if you take all those publications that are in the thousands, they do it with mutations to find the pharmacophores, but it's the same, or to find the important residue in a receptor, whether to connect to a G protein, to oligomerize, or to bind the ligand. And therefore, I would like to say that I will jump over many slides so that don't worry, um, that the most important things which Victor is a good biochemist has understood. Can you see if I'm standing here? No, you can't see. Why don't you say something? Uh, the most important thing was, which I, as a, as a poor physicist, when I came to biochemistry in Stockholm, was told that you have to have a very sensitive assay and you have an enormous amount of static material. And he fulfilled this. Nobody ever talks about it because they thought, it was natural. It was not natural at all. In fact, there was not a single person at the Karolinska Institute, including his boss, who didn't make fun of him, that if you want to smell where the Karolinska Institute is, you will find it because Viktor Muti is cooking tons of porcelain gut. And that is a smelly project. But they didn't understand that if you are looking for something which is about one ppm of the total amount, then you need a lot. And the second thing, you need a very sensitive assay. And in the beginning, he has been working on insulin release from pancreatic islets, which was then by far the most sensitive bioassay you could think of. Not only was it extremely important for public health, since insulin had to be made and calibrated for the diabetics of Sweden, and so later on through Novo and New Disc Insulin for the world, <laughs> but and first, which also used the same assays. The second thing, which I think was the most important by far, was number two. The, the concept that the, why there are hundreds and hundreds of peptide fragments. Proteins are either disappearing in the proteasome after ubiquitation, or they are chopped off by exo- and endopeptidases. And if you find a protein which is not taken by a C-terminal endopeptidase, which are very active enzymes, then it is most likely having some signal function. And this was an insight which has led his work. So the practical and very, very important two things, large amount of material, and by large I mean tons, and sensitive assay, I mean sensi more sensitive than femtomol per liter is detected, which was then nothing else than hormonal assays. And then the concept that we should look for C terminally. And they very clearly, it was not a mistake. This is as you read. Chemical determination of polypeptide hormones, fragmentation analysis, and carboxyterminal amidated groups. That's what they were looking for. They did, it was not an accident. And they first made uh, two-dimensional gels and chromatograms of c terminated amides of every amino acid, and then they were looking peptide like this. And after that, they had a very well-worked-out strategy. They made antibodies, polyclonals at that time, later monoclonals, to peptide fragments, which they were using not to measure the peptide, 
there were no reading ministries or analysis around yet. Yarlow and Peter Perman did not publish them. But they used it as an immunoadsorbent to identify other family members of the peptides. It was incredibly smart. Then you all of a sudden could use the same extracts. Not only did do that, but also showed you that long before you could clone the cDNA and find out peptides which are through processing of it and, and uh, translation of the processed mRNA would give you glucagon and glucagon-like peptide and GLP-2 or GIP. And this is how they discovered families. And they also tried to uh, purify the receptors. They have asked us to synthesize peptides, which they biotinylated. At that time, there was no more high affinity binding than biotin, avidin binding. And they have tried to isolate receptors this way. And sometimes they were successful. When, and they followed the literature. When cDNA uh, techniques became available, um, they have used every peptide which they knew the sequence of. And there is a whole group of people we don't talk about, but the former princess of the Swedish Academy, Don Lahrhammer, made his whole career on cloning based on the neuropeptide Y sequence, all NPY cDNAs, NPY receptor cDNAs. And thereafter, the peptide had to be also studied for its distribution, and that is was happening by synthesizing the peptide and labeling it. The most common labelings were uh, 125 iodines, either by chloramine T or by Bolton Hunter. And this was thanks to that Ulo Langel has been diligently and rapidly synthesizing the peptides, and we had the best of possible collaborations with, first of all, with Bruce Merrifield at Rockefeller, who invented solid phase peptide synthesis. We had Anders Schundén, who did the PhD. You guys have gone to pretty good PhD places. Didn't you find an iron response element somewhere at the National Cancer Institute? I think you have gone to, all of you have gone to very good postdoc places. I believe that if they go to better postdoc places than they were doing their PhD, that can only be good. And the most important is, when we come to drug targets, that it turns out that these receptors are all seem to belong to the GPCR class B. And this means that these have many binding sites, not only for the peptide, but also for negative and positive allosteric modulators, and they often oligomerize. And you may say, so who cares? But in fact, the first most well sold drug, the one for benzodiazepine, also known as allium, is just an allosteric modulator of the GABA ligated chloride channel. Of course, we didn't know it because it was discovered for its anxiolytic effects by Leo Steinbach through a phenotypic assay in anxio anxious mouse and in anxious wife of his own. <laughs> uh, at that time, you could do clinical trials at an end of one. But I think that this is my main, main slide. I will jump over many because I rather prefer that you follow the genius involved in this seemingly trivialities. Find something which, if you're successful, can be put into humans without any kind of ethical issues, any kind of problems of it will be antigenic. For sign definitely is such. Find a very sensitive assay. At that time, a million times more sensitive than any other. Find an ID which distinguishes the, look, the, the peptide you look for. 
And sometimes you are lucky. So the poor St. Galan in his sea terminal amidated. He had been looking for human galan and it's not amidated. But it has 80% sequence homology. I will not use photomerates. So I give a few examples but of, of, of the papers, but the papers are only interesting because before all this standardization and age factors, these papers were landmarks. And you see, nobody is anymore talking about data sleep inducing peptide, but they understood that the antibody can be used to define motifs. And this was after a short discussion with uh, the monoclonal, with, with Köhler coming over, and I brought him to Victor, and um, since the monoclonal antibodies was made at the Roche Institute of Immunology at that time uh, in Basel, the very first time, we were rather interested in what is the size of the epitope of an antibody. And Victor immediately said, but that could be a motif in a peptide family. So even if it be, did not become a very important, uh, a very important um, family, they understood the methods. And then, very, very rapidly, they were on to that they may be the same hormone be processed in different cell types differently. This is the case for the glucagon gene, processed differently. This is the case for GIP. And what is, people were always saying, and Victor himself was on to it, to find out which are the most important glucagon fragments. Now, Thomas has overemphasized that we would, in my opinion, uh, that we would like to have antagonists to some of the peptide receptors. But in fact, the most sold and most uh, uh, today most important, not only commercially, but endocrinologically, clinically, neuropeptide, gut peptide ligands are the G, uh, GLP-1 receptor agonists. And the most sold ones are actually peptides. Semaglutid is a peptide uh, modified in positions two and eight and given a, a big fatty acid chain which increases not only its half-life from two minutes to about five weeks um, until it's zero. Unfortunately, it also gets it into the brain. So brain receptors are mean. And so, and not to be forgotten that peptides have a very, very short half-life. So if you in, uh, synthesize GRP1, for example, it has a half-life in humans, only two minutes. Because the, usually the number two amino acid is a key pharmacophore. Teeth was the first one to show that in galanin, the key pharmacophore was tryptophan number two. The same depeptidase cleaves it. Once it takes it off the first two amino acids, there is zero effect at any of the three galanin receptors. If you take only a one, then it still works at galan three. And so Merck, which is not liking to make peptides, made a good inhibitor. That's Genovia, DPP4. So this you have seen, and I won't go into much, other than that substance P research was not such a tremendous disappointment, because when substance P, when we talk about pain medicines, we are all looking for pain medicines for three kinds. One, which works in inflammatory pain. And to be honest, Ibuprofen is very hard to beat. Cerebrax was to beat it, but it had a major flow. It was only tested in 15,000 people, which was considered an enormous clinical trial. 
But once it had no, F, no side effect in these, it went into 5 million people, and 1,248 of them died in heart disease, heart attack, which they didn't have any indication of before. So Merck, one of the largest and best companies, almost went under, since the juries in the US have deemed such enormous, enormous fines. And finally, it had to be a class action suit. And it was not the fault of Merck, and it was not the fault. It was the fault of, to imagine that when you have a safe drug, that you will be able to control how many people take it. But of course, no drug is safe. So when we are looking for a pain drug, we look for inflammatory pain. We look for pain which is functioning in bone and cancer pain. And we all know that morphine is not that great in it. And therefore, we are looking for everything. So therefore, we put the NK1 antagonist, which was a big disappointment in sensory pain, into people with, with uh, cancer pain. And those people are usually suffering also from nausea and amazes because of the chemotherapy. And there is today absolutely no better drug than the NK1 antagonist. And this is coming of substance B research. I would argue that the number of cancer patients who is helped by this is enormous. Enormous. So last year, I looked it up, last year there were 420 million doses sold of it. So I don't think it's a failure. And it goes into sick people, really sick people. They are already clinically diagnosed and treated for their cancer. They are treated with chemotherapy because we don't have anything better and more targeted. So I don't think it's a big failure. I think it's a pretty good thing. And this is showing if the drug itself is safe, if we find an indication. The other one is a little bit more speculative, but it does work. And if you will, Talk to anybody who has experienced hot flushes, you will say that that's not a small potato. Okay. So, here is a list of which you have seen from Thomas, the peptide receptors, and, and I added in because the people from whom I took the slide did not have it. And I have taken one because um, this has been something that uh, made me very, very angry in the last weeks. Uh, as you might have followed, for the GRP1 receptor agonist and their use in obesity and in type 2 diabetes, Habener has received the breakthrough prize. I think it's a very well-deserved prize. What I didn't like is that when they asked me to support it, they asked me to put in a sentence about GIP. The peptide Victor discovered simultaneously. And I, the sentence would have said basically that GIP was kind of a mistake of a genius because or a genius of Victor because he didn't understand that it's not GIP, it's GIP-1 which is important. But, if you look at it, you can read the second line. GIP and GIP-1 were discovered at the same time. But if you read the second line, Trisapid is the first dual agonist. It has been just approved. And just read the text. The two together is by far Was it? And it's, it's a real fix, those combinations, because they are covalently linked, one to one. Can it be better? Can it be more clearly better stoichiometry? So I think even on this, Victor was not beaten, not that he ever considered it as a competition. 
He was happy when he discovered something new, and he hoped that it will be interesting. He never used the word to me useful. He said curiosity, curiosity. So the other thing which Thomas has brought me into was the coexistence. These peptides, which he has discovered, obviously, from Borsanka, I will be very, how many minutes do you want? OK. Uh, the, pepti the peptides he discovered were from the gut. The question is, are these peptides or peptide families occurring in real neurons? Can you isolate them from the brain? And one of the first ones isolated from the brain or from, from nerves was, was the one neuropeptide Y here. It's a novel brain peptide, and it was isolated from the brain. And we worked on it. The lab has worked on it. In fact, we produced the very first paper on the NP Y receptors, and the ligand we used was iodinated NP Y, produced by Ulo-Langel synthetically and then iodinated, and then Andershundin has shown its binding, and we also showed this was the very first indication that these receptors are G protein coupled. I have gotten from Lefkowitz a very big lecture on then one doesn't shoot away all these big findings in two papers instead of writing 50 on them. Maybe this is why I am not going to join them together with Kobielka. But what is important is that these collaborations which came from the gut peptides, translated into the peptides which are also isolated from the brain. And as you see, the distributions which I all take from different papers, from Thomas, from Schaffuchse, um, and from many others, show that they have a tremendous possibility. And as I mentioned, not only NPY agonists and antagonists, but the subtype specificity, since there are five subtypes. And since the peptide itself is 36 amino acid long, and it has three pharmacophores, we give you the idea that there may be many drugs coming up. So, Galanin, you have heard an awful lot about, and I hope by now Ulo has forgiven me the enormous amounts of times he had to synthesize galanin and galanin with different alanins in the positions. This is the one which he and Tietland have studied, and we, this was the first peptide in which absolutely systematic everything was scanned with L-alanin replacing any amino acid to find out whether it's a pharmacophore or it's part of a pharmacophore, that amino acid. This is not standard technique. Okay? So, I don't want to go much on it. I only want to say that the number of papers, if it were nothing else than to train brilliant students to become better, then Galanin would have been the best topic to work on. Because what did we do? Not only we determined the pharmacophores, we determined the active fragment. We have, it would have taken for us not being a drug company and not having a big library and not having expressed the receptor as it is today done, very long time to develop antagonists and agonists Ulo has undertaken to synthesize many agonists and antagonists which were peptides. So for the periphery, they were introtically applied, and for the CNS, they were applied uh, the ICV, ICV application, mostly by Jacqueline Crowley, and later on by others. 
There were some small molecules synthesized around the tryptophan number two uh, by famous chemists and by not so famous chemists, but all of them had a weak affinity. Now weak, I mean, is micromolar, but you should remember, remember that acetylcholine is only binding at micromolar affinity to its receptors. Neither the nicotinic nor the muscarinic receptor was ever isolated by using acetylcholine, its endogenous ligand. They were isolated by mustard gas, and they were isolated by bungarotoxin or torpedo toxin, which bind to it. They are high, highly not endogenous ligands. So to make garmic and garnon to be micromolar agonists is not so bad. Not so bad, I should argue. And then there are plenty of studies on its coexistence with serotonin and acetylcholine and with dopamine and noradrenaline. Very early we have shown that there are inhibitory effects in this one. Mena Goldstein was involved, these are Papers, many of them with Fuchs, these are many with Konzolo and Ladinsky, and it was the basis of a very large collaboration with the Marion Agri Institute. And then we did what is today people are doing. We, we have generated the antagonists, also a small molecules, none of them is as good as the ones which Ulo has made when he made M35. And as molecular biology became more facile, we have generated a galanin overexpressing mouse, and we were looking for some effect in the CNS. And we immediately found with our collaborators that the seizure threshold was dramatically changed. And that was a very big deal, and there are still four large programs ongoing, because as you know, in epilepsy, we are not doing extremely well. If you think about it, we don't have too many new epilepsy drugs. We have made GALAR-1 knockout mice, GALAR-2 knockout mice, and today people have made transient knockouts. So I will not go any longer. I can say that my gratitude to Victor can be summarized like this. When I was elected by the US, this was the text under it. This is for me, it's not for Victor, but it is thanks to Victor and to Thomas. You are being honored for contribution to neurofine, including muscarinic receptors, but pioneering work on neuropeptide signaling system. The pioneering part came from Victor and Thomas. I am standing on their shoulders, and I thank you for your time. I hope I did this. Uh, thank you very much. Maybe uh, there are questions we have. I don't think so. Is anybody? Then I use this microphone and ask one question. I was listening very carefully both lectures. <clears throat> you were both talking about peptides, about neuropeptides, and so on and so on. And I expected that you say a few words about replacement of peptides with peptidomimetics. So, Maybe you just uh, say that uh, this is a very bad idea and will never work and so on, but maybe you just okay. have some so, other comments. So, um, I have a slide which will... Um, oh, this is irrelevant. Who I am is totally irrelevant. The work is rele more relevant. Can I go back with this? Does it work? Okay. No. Okay. Uh -huh. 
in this one instance. So GPCRB, to which uh, class of G proteins, these uh, peptides which Victor uh, and others have discovered, have uh, two ways of, of being regulated. One is, of course, the binding of the agonist, like galanil, like NPY, like. And they bind to an extracellular large domain, which is much, much larger than for other GPCRs, like the beta receptor, beta adrenoreceptor. But they also have both negative and positive allosteric modulator sites, which have been quite well proven at the level of structure. Creo-AEM is not expensive anymore. And so, together with the alpha fold, the people in London who sold their company now, back to back. Google from the beginning supported them. It's now part of Alphabet Healthcare, Alpha Fold. So together with them, we have looked at, there are maybe 16,000 identified allosteric sites which are on GPCRs. And this does not include the sites where a GPCR with its seven transmembrane domain is oligomerizing. And one of the first things we did with galanin, which was also one of the first things one has done with the GPCR, that we have shown that galanin receptors form homo and heterodimers. So if you make a yellow fluorescent protein, GALAR1, and a green fluorescent protein, GALAR2, and put, express them in the same cell, you can study whether they homodimerize or heterodimerize. That was the very first study we did. Now it's trivial. Now everybody has to do it. It's like, you know, became like in gymnastics. There is an obligatory program you have to do if you are competing in gymnastics. And then there is a, a special program which you choose yourself. But this is now the Alaskan, uh, the active fragment study, the oligomerization, the homo and hetero oligomerization, these are now part of the absolute every GPCR B goes through. And this means that we have now a very large number of sites to be drugged. And so antagonists will be used as negative or positive allosteric modulators. The people who are in, either have a, a, a company tradition to sell peptide hormones, like Nudisk Insulin and Novo. I should say here, Nudisk Insulin, the lab where Ulo was with Chimonchich, we made Nudisk Insulin's insulin with yeast codon usage. So it all of a sudden the same yeast uh, made 12 to 18 times as much insulin. Then, then if you use the human insulin uh, nucleotide coding. Of course, it was from the best Carlsberg beer brewery yeast. This is what the Danish explanation by it is. So. But anyhow, Novo Nudisk became one company. And, and they like to sell peptides. So semaglutide and, and Vegovi and Ozempic are peptide drugs because they really are, they really feel that they are in the business of selling peptides and they have made their fortune together with Lilly in the US. Novo made its fortune with insulin and her, and, and her did it too in Europe with insulin. And so they are very wedded to make, um, improvements with formulation, like the insulin pen, which one can laugh at. You say, is that a big invention? I can tell you, my mother used to go to the, the nurse down to get her insulin shot 
together with some other well-dressed ladies. It took them half an hour to get dressed for that. The time I brought home the first insulin pen, she said, I don't have the time with this anymore. So, so formulation with peptides is a different business compared to oral drug. So there will be, they will be non-peptidic, mostly allosteric site um, targeted drugs, and there are. Uh, they are now in clinical trials in, in um, uh, epilepsy for sure, uh, for... Uh, for um, um, uh, the, a new narcolepsy drug, which is also non-peptidic, is in phase two, and uh, there are four antidepressant approaches based on NPY and colonine receptors, and they are all non-peptidic because they are aimed to be oral. Now, I would like to make, before you all go home and take ketamine or, or some magic mushroom after you listen to Thomas to say that this is not major depression. This is what is, the approval says, or not the use, the approval says it's for treatment-resistant depression what ketamine was approved which means, treatment resistant means that it didn't respond to the tricyclic antidepressants, which we have used 65 years, in more than 1.2 billion times. And when I go, say a time, mean a 60-day period of treatment. It means that it not responded to the SSRIs, which we have used more than 4 billion times. 90 days at least. They were because they were safe. In fact, today, SSRIs beat anxiolytics because chronic SSRI has less side effects than a benzo. I am sorry to say it after having come from Roche, but it is so. So ketamine was not approved to treat depression. It was approved for treatment resistant depression. Now then it became a big industry around it. It's an incredibly dangerous drug. And when we are playing ketamine plus something, we are taking the edge of how dangerous it is. In most places, Ketamine was, was thrown out because of the psychomotor side effects it gives. It is terrible. If you are part of general anesthesia and you look people at the wake up, you can see that the nicest, kindest people coming out and waking up are saying the most horrific, profane, violent, unbelievable things. If you omit any ketamine or ketamine-like drug from their anesthesia mixture, they don't do that. <laughs> it's not trivial. So, so I think that, that today the, the majority of antidepressants remain SSRIs because they can be given by your general practitioner and because it's safe and a safe always beats efficacy, because efficacy can be achieved by placebo. Can. Safety cannot. <laughs> Thank you very much. For <laughs> I hope so. I didn't disappoint Thomas or you. Okay. I want to try to do that. So, thank you very much. Now, uh, according to a uh, program, uh, I open this door, and there will be some uh, coffee. And we continue um, 2.30, yeah? So, thanks. Time is flying uh, fast and now we have a second part of this um, uh, meeting. So, first of all, I invite Hülo Langel. He was mentioned many, many times in previous talks, and now he can make a 
summary of his results himself. Thank Thanks. you. Thank you for a kind introduction. I will show again this magic room, uh, Victor, and I, I can only add to, to, to the com as a comment that due to my dimensions, I, 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 I was fit into this room alone with Victor. If some people could manage to have two, so our honor, honorable president Sommer uh, mentioned before uh, uh, soft power of science, and I, I think in in my memories about Victor, this is just the soft power of science which characterized Victor for me. And uh, I mainly learned from Victor that if you love something and if you do something about it, then it's always interesting, at least, at least in science. And that's why I'm very thankful that I, I met Victor in my life. And this happened around 1987 when I managed to, to get to Sweden to Professor Thomas Partweis' group. And um, uh, of course, Thomas introduced me, Victor, immediately. And uh, the main contact with Victor was in this room. It was a time when, when you had to go to a library, a good library, to copy the scientific articles. And we always <coughs> went to Karolinska Institute and copied something. And then after that, I took a liberty to go to Victor's room and discuss things with him. And, and uh, he was always interested. And, and his very characteristic feature was that he, he was talking about something and when he found somewhere down in, in a pile of articles, this article which was just the right one in this case. And uh, that was very impressive uh, for me. And uh, the Kalanin studies were mentioned here several times. And uh, I was starting with Galanin, I, I was lucky. I think Galanin was just discovered four, four years ago, and I, I was on this. And um, you can see here there are three receptors, and uh, there are several um, biological activities of this neuropeptide, which makes it very, very interesting. And um, I titled my, my, my talk today, Beyond Victor's, Victor's Research. And actually, previous lectures here today was, were always beyond Victor Mutz's research. We are talking about the same thing. What, what has happened after Victor discovered these 50 peptides or more? And, and that is what makes uh, science excellent that it's ongoing it doesn't stop you find new avenues you find new ideas you have fantastic things which are very far from original discoveries sometimes and um, we started from galanin research and then regular galanin synthesis um, I also tried some collaboration with Victor by, by making um, or trying to send him to, from, from Tartu to Stockholm uh, two tons of, of uh, porcelain intestine in frozen state in 1988. I don't know if you younger people, if you understand exactly what I'm saying, but 
two tons of, of, of intestine by a ship in Soviet time from Soviet Union to Sweden. Oof. And, and that was not a very successful project. Victor paid for, for these two tons of material, but it, it was only 15% of activity of these peptides which he separated from them, and we, we stopped that. Um, the problem was that in, in, in slaughterhouse you have to take the, separate the intestines and, and wash them intensely, and uh, we, we paid for these slaughterhouse people, of course, for that, and, and, but they took the payment, but they didn't wash them very carefully. So we sent two tons of shit in, in summary. That happens. And uh, later, Ranar Sillard, who was working in Victor's lab, succeeded better to, to separate uh, sheep brain in Wuru slaughterhouse, right? And uh, this worked, and we, we were able to together to, to publish a sheep sequence as well. Um, but in our lab, we, we were thinking about uh, developing ligands for galanin receptors, which are three receptors. When we started, it was only one receptor known, then three receptors became available. <clears throat> but we started from uh, rat brain receptors, and then we knew from NMR what the structure of galanin was uh, on the left. We know uh, by doing studies together with Dietland in Tamash's lab, uh, we, we were able to define the pharmacophores. And, and then we got the idea uh, to make chimeric ligands, where we have a at, at N terminus, the, the N terminus of galanin, and at C terminus, different sequences from other neuropeptides which were known to, to have activity at C terminus. And um, they were, some of them are listed here. Um, you can see uh, some are combinations of two neuropeptides, and some are not, some are just. Um, Kalanin part connected to fantasy sequence, alanine leucines. You can see M871 here also, which I will show you a bit later. Uh, they were fantastic kalanin receptor ligands. They, they contained shorter fragments of neuropeptides, uh, but these neuropeptides uh, or these ligands were recognized by both. Uh, components, both neuropeptide receptors. And uh, that was a synergistic effect, and that seemed fantastic because the improvement was like a thousand times. So we believed that they bound to both receptors simultaneously. And I took this example, uh, which is again, uh, it is involved here. Uh, this is from 92, more than 30 years ago, and um, we, we presented in this, this journal this, this very naive idea that these chimeric ligands could simultaneously bind to both uh, receptors, and it is Basically, this, this paper is, is unnoticed. Uh, it has around 100 citations only uh, in 30 years. Uh, but what happened after, after that, and in parallel with this work, with this insignificant work, was that um, dimerized receptors became evidently available. Uh, 
multimerization was, has been indicated today. And uh, uh, if I have a good day, then I can say that we, we, we also made some contribution to this. But now these several receptor mosaics and things like that are available uh, in, in many, many examples. And um, here is uh, one example of, of later published uh, to, uh, to 2023 uh, when, when such a thing was published re most recently. Now, if we look at this Ligands, when um, we made, I, I think we made hundreds of, of these ligands. Later, Runner was also involved in synthesizing them because the colony receptor subtypes became available and we tried to contribute into this, this field, uh, having, having um, these receptors expressed in cell lines. <coughs> And some of them are, are shown here uh, in, in, in this, this, this figure. On the right side, you can see two uh, non-peptide ligands. It was a question about non-peptides, not uh, uh, mimetics. And Galnon and Galmik, Galmik is from Thomas Group in, at Scripps, I remember. And Galnon we made together in Stockholm. Uh, short, uh, small molecules which have maybe micromolar activity only, but which showed very, very interesting effects. And uh, we tried to publish the Galnon, at least in, in, in Nature Medicine, and after fifth round, uh, we got rejection. Uh, one referee uh, had a very good argument. He said that it will never be a, a drug. I don't know where he knew it, but that, that was a response uh, and that it was rejected finally. Uh, but uh, there are several nice publications with, with these peptides and they have their future ahead, I think. And now, uh, ending this topic, so I, I, I found a recent, very recent paper with our um, M871, which I showed you before which is based on galanin, and it's an antagonist. Uh, we, we, um, uh, we made many, many experiments with that. Other people basically did this experiment, but I found this where it is a galanin receptor 2 selective ligand, and uh, it has a role in, in craniofacial development. Can, can, could Anybody like Victor or somebody in early days predict that we find this kind of effect? I have no idea. Yes. Yes. And uh, it's just an example in an event where it will, will find itself, this study or research. But then, I very briefly will, will talk about drug delivery because we have been using many oil peptides for drug delivery, for all types of drug delivery, which is very interesting. And this topic is interesting because the size of uh, efficient drugs becomes larger and larger nowadays. You can see here comparison of 2007 and 22, and uh, without looking at the names on, on this, you can see that the, the molecules of drugs have become much, much larger. And this is a challenge for drug development. You need to use special delivery vehicles to get these drugs over the, blood, over the barriers to the cells or over the blood-brain barrier or whatever barrier. And uh, you can see the sizes approximately where the cell therapy 
is not characterized by molecular mass, but uh, these sizes are very well known and this can become very big. Um, now, many, many uh, delivery vectors are available there. Some of them are listed here uh, and they, they can be um, peptides or they can be non-peptides, they can be uh, different kind of, of molecules and, and many of them are and the cargos can be also all kind of molecules. Peptides, proteins, nucleic acids, small molecules and even cells. And uh, the issue is to get them through these barriers into the cells sometimes or into the targeted organs in a body, because we are talking about the drugs and we are interested in, in taking the, the drugs into, into this target. For example, cancer. We don't want to kill uh, other tissues than, than cancer cells. And this is a tricky thing because we mostly don't understand what we want to do and how to do it. Um, in vivo is extremely difficult today. Um, we, we get inflammatory and immunogenic responses and we have to improve the targeting. And, and that leaves a, a huge area of research to solve these problems. <coughs> and that's why uh, we, we are concentrating on one piece of this, and this is cell penetrating peptides, or peptides, which are short peptides. And I also listed here that uh, several groups in Estonia are, are also involved in, in CPP uh, research. And these peptides are many. I listed only a few of them. In, in, in red frames are, are ours. Uh, but there are really thousands of them available today. And our peptides are based again on these chimeric calanin based peptides, which I showed you before. Uh, and basically, the best um, lead was transportan. Uh, and transportan 10, which you can see, and, and in, in a sequence, you can see the calanin based sequence. So they contain a part of galanin and in C terminus there was a mastopara and a wasp venom uh, toxin peptide. And when we put galanin together with, with this mastopara, we got an incredibly interesting peptide uh, for some reason. It was by chance. Uh, we got this peptide which entered the cells when incubated in small uh, quantities uh, together with cells. And um, we have also now hundreds of these peptides available. Pepfects and Nickfects are uh, listed here. You can see there is always a short canonin sequence available. And uh, this, is, this is something which I don't know if this is relevant at all, but we still use this, uh, this sequence. And what we can do with these peptides, uh, we can use the uh, connection of, of different cargos by covalent or non-covalent uh, strategy, and we can use them for uh, uh, delivery of nucleic acid, basically, but also the other types of molecules. And uh, we can, uh, by adding homing sequences, for example, uh, target them to different tissues. And uh, here are these examples for gene silencing and gene therapy, which they have a great potential for. And I, I show you few pictures about it, where our PEPFACT is, is connected together with the oligonucleotide and, and it forms a, a 
nanocomplexes and uh, uh, in electron microscopy you can demonstrate this uptake of, of these nanoparticles and uh, in vivo injected here the siRNA is injected to knock down the uh, uh, luciferase protein you can see that uh, down knockdown of, of, a, of a fluorescent protein was achieved. And here is one example of using tumor targeting where we put the target peptide together with our CPP uh, and, and we achieve a, a tumor delivery of, uh, uh, of, of an animal model and, and also we, we are able to show uh, tumor growth inhibition in some cases. And um, final uh, illustration is about uh, brain delivery. It, is, it seems uh, that in, in case of, um, in, in some vectors, we are able to label the brain tumor after, after IV injection. It's a glioma targeting, so we, call, uh, we called it G-HOPE peptide. And um, I think this will go further and further. This, this research is not a dead end, it's just opening, I think. I think it will continue until we have all good drugs based on, on such delivery methods, of course. I, can't guarantee that something very new and exceptional will come up, but then it will be then. That's it, thank you. So, thanks. Now, time for questions, we have time. Yeah, Martin. Thank you, <clears throat> thank you, love, for a very interesting uh, lecture. What do we know today? How uh, CPPs enter the cells? Do we know the the mechanism of internalization? Yeah, there are several mechanisms, and and one of them is uh, which is often available for short peptides themselves, and this is that they will go through uh, plasma membrane by, by membrane interactions, charge-charge interactions. Uh, but in most cases where you uh, try to deliver the cargo, like uh, bigger molecules, then endocytosis takes over. And uh, in that case, endosomal escape is the most important thing. And what we believe is that our peptides are, we, we have been lucky that, that they have a good endosomal escape. If we, if we talk about plasmids and we want to take them into a nucleus, we need only a few copies in, in the nucleus to start it. So it's not maybe so, so, so. But if we talk about our recent discovery of mRNA transporters, which should be in cytosol, and then we have uh, even peptides available which, which are very efficient in, in such delivery. So it's, and it's very different for different peptides, this mechanism. And, but I think these two basic mechanisms are, are in parallel. Okay. Yeah, let's go. If you figure out the uh, two dimensional structure of galanin, you would pu put it like victory like. like we Sorry, like. what? You, you put it like uh, we like or victory like. What is the structure of galanin? Uh, galanin structure, you put it like uh, we like. It, it, it's how? like a horseshoe structure I showed you in one figures, uh, which is based on NMR studies. 
But of course, every, every peptide is very flexible and it yeah. depends on environment. And later, Astrid Gresson showed that, that if we put it in STS mice cells, it's again the same structure as it is, that it was shown by NMR structure in, in water. But I, I guess it's very, very flexible and uh, depending on interaction partners, it will change. More questions? Okay, thank you. No, thank you very much. <laughs> now we have a next um, speaker, Marzarma, and uh, dear president. Uh, academicians, guests. First of all, I am I'm, I'm really grateful to Jaak and um, Ulo organizing this event and of course inviting me also to this uh, uh, very important event. So I, uh, I heard about Victor first time actually from my mother who was a gastroenterologist. And then I realized that there is a man whose name is Mut, and then I realized that He's Estonian, and that he has discovered a bunch of, of peptides. Then I met him actually in 1988, uh, when my dear friend Håkon Persson invited me to give a lecture at Karolinska. And Håkon, as a civilized gentleman, had invited also Victor to that uh, lecture. So that was my first meeting with Vec Victor. Uh, I spent then two days uh, with Victor, and uh, Victor invited me also to his home, where I actually met Michael Mut, who will speak later today. So um, uh, we today really uh, honor, uh, I think, the greatest Estonian born biochemist. Uh, and uh, he was a giant who discovered a number of gastrointestinal peptides. And I think um, he moved gut endocrinology uh, to a level of, of brain research. And now when we know that, uh, uh, what is the impact of the gastrointestinal microflora, I think all his discoveries have an extra impact. Um, I'm not original showing uh, uh, what he has discovered. He has discovered a, a, a really a great number of uh, uh, brain and gastrointestinal uh, peptides, which um, along when we understand how the enteric nervous system works, and we know that it actually works uh, largely different uh, from uh, the rest of the peripheral nervous system, it, it functions more or less as a brain. And Mike Gershon, one of the uh, big uh, uh, names in uh, gastrointestinal uh, neuroscience, calls it the second brain of a man. So I will today a little bit introduce you to the second brain of the man, and also then focus a little bit on the early development of the enteric nervous system and also to some of the pathologies related to that. that uh, so I will eventually touch ground with my, my, my own re research. So, uh, well, just to remind you that neurons uh, are uh, cells which receive, store and tr transmit information and they do that mostly at the, at the synopsis. But what is probably not so well known is that uh, our brain has 10 in the power of 11 neurons, which is actually equal to the number of stars in the Milky Way galaxy. And these 10 in the power of 11 neurons make 10 in the power of 14 contacts. Well, uh, we now almost every day hear about the uh, uh, 
artificial intelligence. And I must admit that most of the guys who talk about artificial intelligence and tell that they develop artificial intelligence on the basis of the, how brain works, I'm always getting surprised because I, I, I don't know how brain works. How can you design AI based on what uh, we don't know how it works? So, uh, remember, we have 10 in the power of 14 contacts, which is more than 100 times more than stars in the Milky Way galaxy. And now comes the most important part. In the, in the computer, these contacts are fixed, but in the brain, all these are changing. And actually, these changing uh, the synaptic contacts in the brain is actually the basis of memory and learning. Without that, we, we can't memorize, we can't learn. And of course, uh, neuropeptides are doing a very, very important role in that. As already uh, uh, Thomas in his uh, plenary lecture mentioned, uh, neurons are exciting because they have very long axons. And uh, you have, have to transport sometimes things uh, one meter, some of the motor axons are really almost one meter long. So you have to drag energy there, you have to drag mitochondria there, but you don't drag most of the proteins because nature has decided to do it so that it has put ribosomes in axons and dendrites and you transport messenger RNA, which Erin Schumann now more and more has actually demonstrated. All this makes brain uh, very energy consuming. Also, our brain is only uh, 1.3 to 1.5 kilo. It consumes 20% uh, of our energy. So Estonian saying Pia on Kum is actually totally scientifically justified. So it is really hot, the head. So an enteric nervous system, as I said, uh, is a second uh, brain of the man. It functions very independently. Uh, it is uh, regulating gut motility. It doesn't need any input from the brain. It does it absolutely independently. And it forms also circles. And like also the brain, it is extremely important that it has uh, almost 100 times less neurons, but makes perhaps even more contacts than, uh, uh, than the brain neurons make. So, uh, uh, in contrast to other peripheral neurons, although we now, using this single neuron sequencing, also learn more and more, but I think enteric nervous system is also interesting because it contains a great number of different types of neurons. We think in the brain we have at least 1,000 dif types different neurons. In the enteric nervous system, I think we have perhaps 20 or even more types of neurons. I'm not going into the anato anatomy of that, but uh, they are mostly um, located in two different plexus the myoenteric plexus and in the submucosal plexus. So uh, uh, another very interesting uh, property of the enteric nervous system is that it, like our brain, virtually lacks connective tissue. It is consisting mostly of neurons, glial cells, and then uh, our brain also microglia, which we can consider as immune cells. And if in our brain, according to the best knowledge, uh, glia and neurons are 50-50, then in the gut still, uh, glial cells are the majority. So, uh, I'm now, the rest of my talk, uh, discuss about the development of the enteric nervous system. So, uh, the... Uh, the whole peripheral nervous system, including enteric nervous system, uh, comes from the uh, neural crest in Estonian, uh, neural hurry. 
And that is a special population of stem cells in the neural crest, which give rise to the entire enteric nervous system. So if you look at the mouse, then in the embryonic day number nine, these crest cells start to migrate and rather rapidly, in almost two days, they colonize the whole gastrointestinal tract. So the migration is extremely important for these cells. They, as you understand, migrate long distances. And they are not neurons. When they, uh, when they travel, they still proliferate. And then when they finally come to the right place, they stop dividing and differentiate into the neurons. So actually, until the mid-90s, it was virtually nothing known what regulates the migration, survival, and maintenance of enteric nervous. Uh, oh, well, there are well, some indications that uh, growth factors regulate the de development, but I think in uh, the, the very important uh, uh, discovery was made in 1996, my lab included at that time also one lab in Genentech and uh, one, one, one lab in Harvard when we did the uh, knockout of a growth factor called GDNF. GDNF was known as, as a factor which acts on dopamine neurons. We were making the knockout and of course we were thinking that, ooh, there will be a phenotype in the, in, in the brain. No, we were more than surprised to see that these mice almost completely lacked the whole enteric nervous system. Then, a few years later, we, and also two other labs, discovered that GDNF unexpectedly signals to the receptor tyrosine kinase red. And then we realized that Vasilis Pachnis, who had published a red knockout paper back in 1994, had exactly the same phenotype. Like lack of enteric neurons in the whole gastrointestinal tract below stomach. So we discovered clearly one factor and signaling system which plays a crucial role in the migration and later a lot of studies showing also that not only the migration but also later for the maintenance and survival and functioning of these neurons. So what is GDNF? GDNF is a protein we call neurotrophic factor. These are uh, factors which uh, uh, regulate uh, the development and survival of the, of the neurons. And uh, as we know, neurons, when they are born, they start to send their axons to the target, then they form synapses. And actually, in, during the development, especially during the peripheral nervous system development, the neurons overproduced. And about 50% of the neurons, which are initially born, are removed. So what, uh, what happens is that those neurons which reach the target and get the trophic support, uh, they will stay, whereas 50% of the neurons uh, will, will die. So like um, the ABBA, the winner takes it all. So, uh, uh, Victor Hamburger, uh, the outstanding uh, neuroscientist working uh, at uh, Washington University in St. Louis, uh, actually was the first to propose the so-called target field on neurotrophic theory. And then Hans Turner and Dave Bard, the guys who discovered brain-derived neurotrophic factor, um, developed that theory to the end. So, neurotrophic factors keep neurons alive, stimulate neural outgrowth. And, uh, and for that, uh, Stanley Cohen and Rita Levantacini got the Nobel Prize for um, uh, Physiology or Medicine in 1986. I put here Victor Hamburg also picture because he actually predicted the existence of these factors. And when I um, uh, lecture to the students, then I uh, say that Please look carefully on the picture. 
And if you carefully look at the picture, then you notice that Stanley Cohen uh, died when he was 99, Rita when she was 104, and Victor Hamburger when he was 102. So uh, if you select the subject of research, study neurotrophic factors, the end result is good. And I sometimes say that I don't look so bad either. <laughs> that is on your personal responsibility. So, so as I said, GDNF and the receptors um, uh, regulate the development of the enteric nervous system and, and actually have also impact to the pediatric disease called Hirschsprung disease. So, uh, so GDNF uh, is a member of the, of the family, we call it, uh, nowadays GDNF family, I don't go into the details of that. GDNF is also now very greatly considered as a potential drug for the Parkinson's disease. Uh, so what they, how they work is that uh, they first bind to the core receptor, then recruit the transmembrane receptor tyrosine kinase. This gets activated, which means phosphorylated. That then triggers activation of the phosphorylation of MAP kinase, SART kinase, and AKT kinase, and that causes a fast response in the cells, but then eventually transcription factors will be activated, so the response of the growth factor is actually long-lasting. So, um, talking about Hirschsprung disease, uh, the, you, you can see on the, on the right, uh, in that disease, which is a childhood disease, uh, it's a defect of the migration of the enteric neurons. So they do not migrate until the end of the gastrointestinal tract, so that the rectal area remains aganglionic. And as a result, the, uh, the stools cannot move, and of course uh, the patient will uh, collect a, a lot of gas. Uh, as, a, as a light joke, it turns out that uh, quite a number of world-class swimmers have an uh, uh, easier form of uh, Hirschsprung disease, which, of course, gives you more gases in the gastrointestinal tract and you float better on the water. So it's not a joke, it's, uh, it's actually a fact. So uh, the uh, Hirschsprung disease is uh, uh, largely familial, where from the familial form, 50% of the cases carry red mutation, about 25% carry endothelin 3 or its receptor mutation, and about 10 20% the transcription factor sex, SOX10. There are also many more genes like GDNF. GDNF core receptor, GF alpha 1 and 2, but these are uh, uh, minor, uh, minor players in the game. So in, in Hirschsprung, which are currently quite effectively treated by surgery, uh, still the aganglionic state of the distal end of the ganglion remains. And that, of course, is a great hope. Perhaps we can regenerate some of the uh, enteric neurons in the Hirschsprung patients, which then, when combined with a surgery, could actually work. And indeed, uh, endothelin-3 and GDNF jointly uh, act also in the sporadic forms of the, of the um, uh, uh, Hirschsprung disease. So, uh, when you look at the mutations in RET, then uh, you see that um, uh, the RET has uh, like three, three domains. On the left is a ligand binding domain, which is the extracellular. Then the TM is a transmembrane. And then inside the cell cytoplasmic is a tyrosine kinase, which is a so-called business end of the, of the receptor. And most of the, uh, in most of the receptors, the mutations are in the business end. But here, it's all scattered along the uh, molecule. So for many, many years, it was unclear how mutations in the ligand binding domain could 
do the um, uh, business. And it then turned out that it actually, uh, the, the reason is that it's not exocytosed anymore normally. So the amount of red receptor on the cell surface will be reduced. So, as I mentioned, uh, we, 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 we showed back in 1996 that uh, GDNF knockouts and then uh, Vasilis Pahnis has shown that for red, uh, lack kidneys, which is on the right, and then they completely lack the enteric nervous system. We then started to look at different uh, red uh, mutations using uh, mouse genetics. So, uh, this is a picture with a Red knockout, the enteric neuroblasts stay in the starting point, they don't colonize the gut. In the, uh, in the normal, the whole uh, gastrointestinal tract is colonized. And I, I have to mention here that there are two major isoforms of red. They differ by 43 amino acids at the C terminal. One form has uh, just 43 amino acids more. So we then did the uh, specific knockout of both isoforms. And then we realized that when we uh, have the 51 alone, then we actually replicate the Hirschsprung disease. We have otherwise the normal, so which told us that actually something in the fifth, uh, in, in, in these last amino acids are important. So these are the different, uh, different genetic models we used. And then of course we started to, uh, started to think, can we, uh, what can we do for the therapy? So in collaboration with the Nicolas Spillon group in Canada, we used three different mouse models of Hirschsprung disease and then put the recombinant GDNF protein into a foam and inserted that into the gastrointestinal tract. And below you see that in the case of GDNF, actually we very significantly rescued the lifespan of, of the mice in all three Hirschsprung models. We then uh, wanted to know what happens. We were first thinking that we are rescuing mostly the generating uh, nearby existing uh, enteric neurons. But in a more closer analysis, we realized that actually GDNF mostly induces the birth of new neurons. And what was most surprising that uh, it, uh, it induced a transdifferentiation, so that most of the neurons which were born were born from glia. So I am now actively investigating that to understand what is the process. And this is also a new property of GDNF, what we never uh, knew before. So by, at the end, of course, uh, I, I should say that uh, uh, GDNF or any other gross factor protein is not ideal for the therapy. It has uh, many, many limitations. The proteins and GDNF in particular, they diffuse very poorly in the tissues. They are expensive to produce, store, transport. And if you deal with neurological diseases, then you have the problem what Ulo tries to solve the blood-brain barrier penetration. So we were definitely looking for small molecules which could mimic the action of, um, uh, of, uh, of GDNF. And this is a collaboration with a company called GeneCode and with my old good friend, Matti Karelson, uh, one of the best chemists in this country. So our starting point was when we solved the crystal structure of GDNF and, and its score receptor GFR alpha one and realized that confirming the, the model by site-directed mutagenesis that actually the key interactions between the ligand and the receptors are in a very narrow area. And that was an intellectual stimulus to go and hunt for small molecules. So we have been now able to find molecules which uh, 
we hope uh, next year uh, enter clinic. Uh, we have shown they work actually in stem cell derived uh, dopamine neurons. And we hope we can use them also to treat Hirschsprung disease. So I will finish by thanking my current and, and former, current on the left side and former who contributed to this, uh, mostly to the genetic work on GDNF and GDNF receptors. And I thank you for the attention. Thank you. That was in time. No, very precise. Uh, thank you. Uh, now, questions, please. Yeah. I, I know that they have tried to get small uh, agonists for NGF for a very long time. Is, what is, this, is there progress in that field? I, I, <clears throat> yeah, I, I think uh, uh, the big pharma uh, already in early early 90s tried to get uh, using high throughput screening uh, the small molecule uh, uh, agonists to many growth factors, but they usually fail. And I, I think one of the reasons was that the quality of the libraries at, uh, in the early 90s were not very good. We are currently using uh, really high quality libraries where the vast majority of the compounds are soluble, are not toxic, etc. So we, we have now GDNF mimetics, which bind to GDNF receptor with the affinity of 10 nanomoles, having half-life of six, six hours, very efficiently penetrating blood-brain barrier, having uh, very nice uh, uh, PI, PK uh, profile, uh, no, no activation of HERG, etc., etc. So, yeah, I, I think it's, it's a question of time now. They are coming. So, more? Uh, a picture. Can you, oh, the, the photo? Yes. Oh. Uh, Ah, uh, you, you missed uh, Estonian uh, greetings, or, or you, you want me to explain the... Yeah, well, this, this first of all, uh, the photo is made by my, my daughter, who is a nature photographer. And uh, um, my message is, that, uh, is a question. Uh, did we found the crystal ball? Uh, but... <laughs> But this is actually a piece of ice in the, in the evening light. I, I like the picture. <laughs> so, some more? Yeah. yeah. Uh, thank you for your nice presentation. Uh, I have a small question, maybe a little bit outside of your um, research field, uh, regarding insulin-like uh, growth factors. There is a whole family of these. They look like insulin. Insulin is a tyrosine kinase receptor related, and uh, several other uh, have different receptors like G protein couple receptor. Do you happen to know anything about these um, uh, kinds of molecules in, yeah, they are uh, like yeah. growth factors, so to yeah. say. Well, uh, there, is, there are two of them, uh, insulin like growth factor one and two. And uh, they both uh, uh, have their own receptor, which is a receptor tyrosine kinase. They are actually both implicated uh, uh, quite a bit uh, in the regulation of the uh, uh, of the nervous system, especially I think in the in the uh, cortical neurons. And uh, insulin-like growth factor number two is 
or its activation is the main reason why our countryman Verpalo used uh, growth hormone. Because growth hormone has no effect on, on any physical, unless you want to uh, grow your muscles, but why, why a skier should grow his muscles. So he uses that because growth factor human growth hormone very robustly activates the synthesis and release of insulin-like growth factor. Insulin-like growth factor uh, for, uh, enhances the physical recovery. So, but we may have a guy who knows better than me about these molecules. We happen to isolate one of the these molecules from porcine brain in early 2000. Uh, it was called uh, relax in three. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. But it's a G protein couple uh, ah, receptor okay, yeah, like yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. The, the, the one and two are uh, through the tyrosine kinases. Yeah. It is indeed the, the a, a, a fantastic step to produce a small molecular uh, agonists to this um, cross factor receptors. The, the big issue is that there is almost no guarantee for the promotion of malignancies. And that cannot be ever excluded under then in very large chronic studies of their use yeah. because we don't really know what's already uh, a primary tumor which may require very few and it was not only the quality of libraries it was the tremendous failure of making anything of of um, the finding of, of um, the heterodimers of insulin receptor and the IGF-1 receptor heterodimer, which almost all solid tumors were uh, carrying, 75% uh, of all human solid tumors so have them. In that and regard, this, is a, this is a, a terrible problem, which is in elicing of their biology was not the quality. But I would like to say, make an, a very Estonian comment, if you permit me, on occasion of your, your sure. talk. I did not realize that you will talk about libraries. But probably everybody in this room knows. To me, it was a surprise that in Tartu, there is a collection of seeds and leaves and roots um, which is one of the largest in the world, but the large is not always the best. But since you spoke about libraries, we have to say that no matter how ingenious chemists we have, inspiration comes from natural molecules. Yes. And we also have to say that this library of seeds, much of them collected in the Tsar's Russia in Kamchatka has been the number two uh, target of first of the German occupiers of Tartu and then of the Soviet occupiers taking it back to Puschino. Yet that library of natural compounds is not being systematically um, examined by, by Estonian and other efforts, although there are so many rumors about it that five James Bond films could be made of them. <laughs> well, uh, I could add that many, many in this room, including myself, went in Soviet times to expedition in Kurili Islands to enrich the library. We were uh, collecting bamboo to extract uh, the, the uh, carbohydrates, which were believed to be extremely important uh, drugs, anti-cancer drugs, used in Japan for ages. And now um, 
I suggest we um, have our last speaker. Uh, I would say that, that now we return very precisely to topic of today's meeting. We return to Victor's, no, well, maybe private life or so. So, and I'm extremely great honor to invite Michael Mut. And I'm really <laughs> grateful that he found uh, time to, to join us. <laughs> Hello, I'm an old bird here. Um, unfortunately, I have no photos with me or visuals. I planned to take them, but forgot that my summer cottage. All I'm going to tell you comes from two sources or layers. First, the first is family lore, what my late parents and my granny told me. And the second comes from personal contacts with Victor that were not extensive contacts, but still quite substantial. Victor Mutt, or Vicky, as all Victors are called all over the world, was my uncle, my late father's younger brother by three years. First about his background, family background. Victor was what we call the second generation of intelligentsia. It means his parents were educated people. His father was of very humble origin, almost a peasant's son. He graduated from, he became a military man. He graduated from St. Petersburg Military Academy, became a staff officer, officer fought in the First World War. In St. Petersburg, he met his future wife, Victor's mother, who graduated from the Herzen Institute, that was the only institute for the whole Tsarist Russia, where headmistresses for children's schools were coached. After the Soviet uh, Bolshevik takeover, they came to Estonia. He offered his services to the newborn Estonian Republic. He fought in the war that we call the War of Independence. He was decorated, awarded, and for his services he, he, got, he was awarded uh, land, like so many uh, Estonians. It was a piece of a manor that was expropriated from the German, German barons. It was in southern Estonia, a place called, called Kidjarve. It was a nice place. It became their family retreat, or otium, as Victor joked, otium, their bright's head, so to say. Victor, after the war, he joined politics for a short time, but was soon dismayed. He was a member of our parliament, but left. He didn't like this squabbling of politicians, because he was rather not an not a easy person to get along, I suppose. He was stubborn or insisting on his own opinion, highly principled. He also fell out with his military superiors, uh, but Estonia being a civilized country, opponents, political opponents, were not executed, not beheaded. Sometimes they were sent into diplomatic exile. And Victor's father became Estonian representative in the United States. Not full ambassador, Estonia was a poor country, couldn't afford full ambassador, his title in the end was chief consul in New York. He took his family with him 
his wife and his oldest son, my father. Vicky Victor was left behind because he was just born one year old and it was thought it's too dangerous to carry him across the water. It took more than a week. So Victor was sent to his grandparents, to Sarema or Özel, to Valjala. He was quite lucky there, I, I suppose. In a, in a few years' time, though, his mother came back to fetch Victor, and they traveled. Victor told me, joked about his nurse who went with them. The place where they stayed, the, his grandfather's grandparents' place was roughly six kilometers from the coast. But the, the nurse, a simple peasant woman called Katrin, she saw the sea for the first time when they traveled on the ocean liner to New York. What he did in, what Victor did in New York, I'm not aware of. Quite possibly he went to kindergarten and attended a few classes in prime school. At least he picked up his English there because he was fluent in English. In 1932, they returned. His parents retired to this Otium or Kiderwe place. Victor went to school, to Tartu. He commuted daily. Kiderwe was 40 kilometers from Tartu. This commuting business is important because I have to stress one point. For some reason, Victor was not his father's favorite son. I don't know the reasons, but so it was. Of course, he was not mistreated, by no means no, but just not much was expected of him. It's quite a, an irony. A bright future was not foreseen for him. And Victor told the only time he could prepare his lessons was during this commuting on train, because as soon as he got home, it started, Vicky do this, Vicky do that. They were quite comfortably off, not too rich, but still. So the boys shouldn't have to do manual work. But their father was very, how to say, principled, and he insisted that boys learned manual work, manual labor. And that's why I'm quite convinced that Victor, in, in his late 60s in Stockholm, he knew, he would have known how to harness a horse. Then times began to change in Estonia. First, the Russians came in with their bases. Then the coup was staged in Tallinn. Uh, Estonia joined, so to say, joined the Soviet Union and the Russian occupation started. Very many people were arrested, including Victor's father. He was taken away in July in 1940, and as we, le as we learned later, he was executed in 42 in, in Kirov. At least that's the official version. Then the Germans came in. Victor still attended his school in Tartu. He graduated in 43, and then he was 20 years old, and he should have joined the German army. He got the invitation to the military camp. He went there, it was in Mardo, and he was to become an auxiliary force for Luftwaffe. But he didn't like the idea of becoming a German soldier, so he escaped from the military camp and went to Tallinn to his uncle. He couldn't stay there for long. His uncle gave him a golden watch as a fee for the boat traffickers who were taking people from Estonia to Finland to escape the refugees. So Vicky went back 
to Loxa, waited there for three weeks for a suitable boat to take him to Finland. Finally, the boat came. It was like all refugee boats, it was overcrowded. In the middle of the sea, a storm broke out. It was a terrible storm. And Vicky told he was bailing out water from the bottom of the boat. And he heard the traffickers speaking among themselves. The boat is sinking. We have to throw somebody aboard, off board. Otherwise, we all will perish. And Vicky thought that he was the most insignificant person on this boat, and surely he will be thrown out. And he said that in later life, he many times saw this trip again and always woke up with his forehead rather sweaty. Luckily, no one was thrown off board because the boat capsized, turned over. It was not too deep, nobody drowned, but of course all that luggage disappeared in the water. So Vicky reached Finnish, Finnish coast empty-handed, nothing. She went inland and met uh, old man and a hermit or recluse by chance of Estonian origin, stayed with him. He read a newspaper, an advertisement that farmhands were needed in Western Finland, and he went there. He stayed in a place of two elderly sisters, spinsters, because all men were fighting and nobody was to take care of the farm. And now Vicky's knowledge of the manual work and the farm work stood him in good stead. And he became something between farmhand and a steward for those elderly sisters. Unfortunately, it didn't last long. Finnish, Finland had dropped out of the war and Russians were, were winning and they put pressure on Finland, that Finland must return all refugees from Estonia. And so the sisters told Vicky that they can't hide him any longer. But they gave him a letter of recommendation to their former friend in Stockholm. It was a certain Professor Jorpes. So Vicky went to Professor Jorpes' place and rang the doorbell. The first person wh whom he met was Professor Jorpes' assistant, a young girl, Birgitta Werner. As it did, uh, and as it happened, she became Vicky's wife, with whom they lived together over 40 years in complete harmony. So it's a scenario for, for a movie like. By the way, all this we learned later. For almost 20 years, we were completely, I mean, my parents and me, we were completely unaware if Victor was alive or what had happened to him. In Stalin's time, it was dangerous to make inquiries, to have foreigners or contacts abroad. It was really dangerous. But during Khrushchev saw at the end of 50s, people began traveling again at least modestly, and sportsmen and uh, scientists, artists. And one of our family acquaintances from the old days, Professor Mora, he was to Stockholm in the beginning of 60s and returned with a letter from Victor, so hand post letter, and then we learned He's alive. And then, little by little, our contacts resumed. But Victor, his diploma from Tartu was not acknowledged in Sweden because it was issued by German occupation forces. It was not acknowledged. So he had to take all his exams 
again. But they did it in crash course. He passed seven exams in one year. Of course, Birgitta helped him morally and perhaps even materially. Then Victor entered Stockholm University. First, he took up English studies because English he knew fluently. But in a year's time, he realized that languages and humanities were not for him. He was more interested in, in science and natural sciences. And so he switched to medicine in Karolinska Institute. And so that he studied, you, that's not, nothing new to you. They have two children, roughly my generation, a bit younger. One, Walter, he had many odd jobs, including taxi driver in Uppsala and a tourist guide in Egypt. He learned uh, Chinese, Russian, among other things. Then he entered politics. He became member of Riksdag for the Green Party. He was their um, foreign relations spokesperson. Then switched to the left party. Her, his sister, Maria, he graduated as a sculptor from Stockholm Royal Art Institute or Acad Academy. But as it turned out, in a few years' time, he or she had an allergy towards those materials. She had to work to make a sculpture. So she took up painting and finally she just helped Victor in his lab and then became, edited some district newspaper, en environment and, and things like this. But what is important, both children are 100% Swedes. Nothing, no link to Estonia. Why is that? I wondered when I was to that place at the same time in 1988. I wondered why, because it's not very usual. Vicky's own explanation was when he came to Stockholm and he needed help, assistance, he went to a, those people whom he regarded as his family acquaintances from the old time. But he was turned down and he received no help from anybody. And it left such an impression on him that possibly he decided to call it quits and have nothing whatsoever to do with Estonians anymore. So he was in no way engaged in emigre activities in Sweden, what were, by the way, quite, quite they were very, no, there was very much going on. But he didn't want it. And he imparted this attitude to his, to his wife, Birgitta and his children probably too, they were very open-minded, especially Birgitta, a very open-minded person. He, several times he even went to the developing world. She was a doctor, by the way, a children's doctor, and to help those people in developing countries, but he didn't want to know very much about Estonia. But on the other hand, when Estonia became independent or started to become independent, uh, a set of brilliant young Estonian scholars from Tartu, they worked in Vicky's lab, and uh, I'm sure he was glad to help those young people to advance their progress in science, and, and uh, he had no grudge to Estonia, nor Estonians. And there is also one more explanation, what I have for, uh, invented myself. Vicky was just a bohemian, in the best sense of the word. He didn't have very strong attachment to blood ties or things like this. He was like a medieval scholar. Wherever there were, were educated people, wherever there were, were, was culture, that was his or her homeland. That was most important to him. 
Now, what kind of person he was? I am not impartial, of course, because he is my <laughs> close relative, but in general, he was a likable person. He, he was not a snob, never, an, never arrogant, never on high horse. He was quite simple, easygoing, not a teetotaler, but very modest in this aspect. I remember how he told me, because I had slight drinking problems at that time, and he told me that 20 gram, grams before turning in at night, that doesn't make you an alcoholic. <laughs> uh, but we were talk, uh, discussing, for instance, uh, the benefits of healthy lifestyle. And Victor, being benignly skeptical about all things, he explained it, it me this way. All this healthy food and sports and sauna, it prevents you getting a premature end. But it doesn't prolong it. Prolong it. Prolong what? I asked. He smiled. Prolong that what is given you by nature from with those genes that you can prolong with all your sauna and, and jogging and health food only maximum one, two years, no more. Uh, it's quite a brave statement, I think. <laughs> then he was very fond of walking. He always walked from his place in Solna to his lab on foot every day and back. And sometimes I, when I was there, I accompanied him and I was always struggling to keep up with him because he was walking so fast. And when I asked him about it, he said that as a schoolboy in Tartu, he had won a bronze medal in uh, uh, speed walking or race walking. That's why he, he walked so quickly. As for the metaphysical issues, I think he was an agnosticist. We discussed these matters too. Uh, once we were walking, he uh, discussing about the life uh, hereafter and beyond, and issues like this, he pointed to a po rain pool. It was raining and the bubbles were springing up and the next moment they were bursting. And Vicky pointed at that and told me, that's exactly how our life is. We come and we go and there is nothing more. And of course he, he, he told it without, it, it, he was, uh, Stoical or, yeah, very stoically. His end came abruptly. A few months before his 75th jubilee, one day he came home, returned from his lab, felt slightly tired, and next morning just collapsed in his kitchen. As much as I know, he had not complained about his death before that, the more so he had a doctor in the family. Birgitta was a doctor after all. Such untimely end is of course tragic because he was mentally very alert, no sign of, of creeping old age. But on the other hand, I think it's, it doesn't, it, it has its good side as well because he was saved of many negative aspects of Old, old age. In general, his life was, to my mind, was dramatic, but also awarding. Quite nice life. And finally, I should like to retail a small side story. It belongs to what I have called in one of my books, The Human Domino by which I mean that life is full of all kind of various connections or the 
things match in unexpected way. You, should, you, you can't think that it's possible. Victor and Birgitta, in their youth, had a friend, a girl of also Estonian origin, who studied with Birgitta, studied medicine. Her name was Karin. Later he, he switched to <laughs> chemistry, to chemistry. In mid-50s, in mid Birgitta was offered a possibility to go to India as child's doctor for two years in the frame of some help program or assistance program for developing countries. He leaped at the chance. The only sticking point was he had a he had son, Vic Walter, who was just born, less than a year old. What to do with him? Birgitta couldn't take him to India. It's dangerous. So she decided to leave it with Karin, who also had a, a small son, a bit older than, Vic, than Walter, but still. It happened so that the boys became good friends, although there was the gap almost four years. They went hiking summer time, made sp go, went into in for sports, did all kinds of things like young people do. The friendship lasted almost during the university, and they were in contacts even later. Of course, later, the life led them apart. The boy's name was Svante. He went to Germany. Why is it important? It's important because of the family name of Karin and Svante. Their family name was Babo. The same Babo who, who studied the Neanderthal man and who recently received the Nobel Prize. So that's what human domino can be like. Thank you. So, uh, if somebody has some questions, yeah. Just a short uh, <clears throat> Thank you for uh, this very nice uh, story. Would you mind uh, publishing this uh, story as a book? Actually, I have, I have done that already. <laughs> I, I decided to publish my memoirs when I was a middle-aged man, because later in life all gets confused. <laughs> so I, I have written about Victor in, uh, I think it was in third or second part of my memoirs, and it came out in 2007 or six or something. So I have, but it's not very extensive. I should make some improvements and additions. <laughs> now more. Yeah, please, Thomas Parte. As a Hungarian, uh, we arrived to Stockholm um, with a boat an East German boat, a lifeboat in which they hidden me, with the dogs walking under me. Victor understood perfectly well how I felt. We discussed this. How does one feel as the man who might be found and thrown into the water? <laughs> it was not many decades in between. But we also had another discussion with Victor, which relates exactly to what you have been kindly retailing, namely that not only was he a Bohemian in the best sense of the word, but he took very seriously that, that a good scientist belongs to the entire world. We have been, his lab and my lab had been taking extraordinary number of foreigners. One, one of that is that there are four or five of them in this room. What else can I say? 
as a documentation, and several of them work with both him and me, but it was not always so, like Professor Yarv only worked with me. And we discussed this on occasion of that there a book came from Jan Cross, who has been evaluated, re-evaluated, and so on. And I told Victor then when, that I have read it because I have been bestowed upon as a gift, treading water, it, it, treading air, it was called the, the translation. And Victor said, I know, but the Swedish critics who wrote that when somebody writes in a small nation's language, then one must continue because the language will not survive. And that's what Hungarian poets, which you always want to translate for me, I tried to translate for him, raw translations, of course, things which he liked. And only Birgitta would interrupt this. <laughs> but not because she disliked it, but because she thought it was far too sentimental and melancholic. This was postmodern Hungarian poet. And he said, but we are completely agreeing that a good scientist, that belongs not to a country, but to the world. And this is but also behind the bohemian attitude, together with this, led him to, to be able to, to take anybody and everybody. And Karolinska was not what it is now. Sweden then was a very special place. Americans wanted to study there because it was intact in Europe, where the rest wasn't. It was a very international place to be a very international scientist. And as Estonian born he was, he was an international scientist. I very much thank you for your reminiscences. It has, been, it has given to me a lot, even though I have been sitting in the same kitchen a lot. I, I forgot one very important moment. When I was to that place in Solna, Vicky took from his uh, wardrobe, his tailcoat, tailcoat, and he showed it to me and laughed that it's his Nobel Prize tailcoat, because he, he puts it on only on the occasion once a year when the Nobel Prize is awarded, and he has to go up on the stage <laughs> the in public, otherwise he hated fussy, fussy clothing. He, yes, he was a bohemian, not bohemian, not in the classical sense, that he, behaves extravagantly or does this and does that. He was, it, bohemian, real bohemianism means freedom of mind. These are people whose kingdom is not of, of, of this world, <laughs> I should say. And then this, uh, the, the real artists and, and real scientists are very similar. Thank you. So now, uh, very soon, only one presentation. And this is my presentation, and it's titled Conclusions. Quite hard to um, make one conclusion. And therefore, before conclusions, I start with uh, acknowledgments. First of all, I would like to thank all our today's speakers. This was very hard to believe that through this snow and fog and, and so on, so, uh, all people can do the travel. And they did, so thank you very much, and it's really greatly appreciated. I am very grateful to Michael, because his few words, it's a short presentation, gave completely different dimension of, to, to this event. So we heard about peptides and uh, diseases and uh, drugs, but now we have completely different, or many of us have completely different uh, understanding of personality. Then about conclusions. Uh, first conclusion is about um, integration. It was quite clear from uh, today's 
scientific talks that real things can be made if you know different things. If you know chemistry, biology, medicine, physiology, and this is good message for young students and uh, people who are going to university today, because I think that to limit education to chemistry or to medicine or to biology separately is, there is no perspective. And this I try to also to transfer this message to our school children and, and maybe um, teachers. The second point is that um, if we are talking about foreign people or foreign scientists, Estonian people in, in foreign countries, and this was the first talk, Tiet uh, made a, uh, some kind of summary. For a small nation, this is a big problem. And there is only one option to fight with such a problem is to have a contact. To have a contact physically, to have a contact mentally, to remember. And uh, I think that today's meeting is contributing to this part of our uh, knowledge. We have missed a lot of good opportunities to thank uh, Victor. But now we at least made some uh, contribution. And then the last conclusion is that the title points that this was this meeting was about um, history of science, history of peptide chemistry, history of neuropeptides, and so on and so on. But I think that the main conclusion from today's is that this topic was about future. I think that it was very clear that um, there is a huge potential in all these um, works which were done by Victor and which were done by his uh, colleagues and cooperating laboratories and students. And let's see, maybe in 100 years there will be another symposium devoted to peptides and neuropeptides and so on. And then we already know how these things are doing great things in practical medicine and uh, practical pharmacology and so on and so on. And finally, I would like to thank all staff of Academy office. These ladies helped us a lot to do this important event. And once more, I thank everybody who attended, and I thank everybody who were here and listened to these talks, and especially those people who made these talks. So, thank you very much. And now I open again the door here. You already know what is behind this door. So everybody is welcome to use their stuff, what was provided by our catering. So once more, thank you and thank you and thank you.